another place. Come with me, let's have a smoke break. Nah, not just a normal break. Let's smoke break. Smoke break. seconds and counting. There were plenty of years where there were guys who would dread being drafted by the Buffalo Bills. Not anymore. Astronauts report it feels good. Team on a 25 seconds. Brandon Bean realizes they're in a window of two to three years max to get this done while the iron's still hot. And getting Von Miller into that situation was big for the Bills. Ten, nine. Oh, ho, ho, baby. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Buffalo Fanatics, z here with you, live on the Buffalo Fanatics YouTube channel on a Monday night, and that of course can only mean one thing, it is the Smoke Break Power by BetUS where the game begins, receive a 125% sign up bonus in the link in the description below, not only on your first deposit, but on your first three deposits. Join and get a 10% gambler's insurance as well for your net losses if you're active for six months. Welcome in, folks. Fresh up a Super Bowl 58. It was a crap game until it wasn't. An instant classic. Don't you love how that goes? The first 30 minutes of a game can be some of the worst ball you've ever seen, but if the finale is good, we will look back at it as an instant classic, and Super Bowl 58 surely was one of the better Super Bowls in memory. And we've been getting lucky, at the very least, when we have no rooting interest in these games. We've been lucky in the sense that these games have been pretty damn awesome. And uh, it's, it's very similar to the Patriots, where every single time the Patriots made the Super Bowl, outside of the victory over the Rams, Almost every Patriots Super Bowl was incredible. And that's exactly what we're getting from the Kansas City Chiefs. Of course, outside of the one Super Bowl they played against Tom Brady. The three Super Bowl championships the Kansas City Chiefs now have, they were trailing by 10 or more points in all three. Somehow found a way to win. They've all come down to the wire. They've all resulted in Kansas City Chiefs victories and of course last night's was no different the kansas city chiefs have solidified folks the start of a new dynasty the torch has officially been passed not that i didn't think it wasn't but if you had any doubts well those doubts are now gone the torch has been officially passed from the new england patriots to the kansas city chiefs who win their third in five years last night 25 22 in overtime in a game where you could argue they were outplayed for 70% of it in a game where you could argue their offense could not find anything on the field for the vast majority of the game. It does not matter. And we've talked about it all year, especially this last month throughout the playoffs. Doesn't matter what you do, how you do it, where you do it, when you do it, these Kansas city chiefs somehow find a way last night was no different. An incredible second half that resulted in what I think we all thought was going to happen. I mean, maybe you didn't, but at this point, I don't know why you didn't. Why? I mean, why you would go into that game yesterday and think Kyle Shanahan, who hadn't won one yet and was on the bad end of, of two blown leads in a Super Bowl, including the offensive coordinator of the greatest blown lead in the history of sports, perhaps, with the Atlanta Falcons. 
How you go into that game yesterday with, with Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid on one sideline and Brock Purdy and Kyle Shanahan on the other sideline with nothing proven. How you go into that yesterday thinking, eh, 49ers got this on lock, never made sense to me. There was well over 10 $500,000 plus bets, I believe, for the 49ers, including multiple $1 million plus dollar bets on the 49ers yesterday. I, I don't know where people were getting that confidence from. Because even when those Chiefs went down 10 points yesterday, you never once thought that that game was over. In fact, weren't you getting a little bit more confident in the Chiefs? It's amazing how it works. I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like it. And uh, it's unfortunate as hell. It is unfortunate as hell what the AFC has become uh, because what it has become as is by far the best conference in the sport. The quarterback talent in the sport in the AFC is uh, is ridiculous. Uh, the amount of talent overall in the in the conference is incredible compared to the NFC, but it really hasn't mattered. It's been owned and dominated by a very short list of teams over the last two decades and no one more than the Chiefs and the Patriots. And now. It, 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 we're we're witnessing the greatest start to a to a dynasty that we've I mean, that we've ever seen. I mean, I really don't know what else to say. It, it's insanity. Six uh, six years as a starter for Patrick Mahomes. We all know we've been all over it. Six years as a starter, right? Six AFC championships, four Super Bowl appearances, three championships in those Super Bowl appearances. And um, and the game went exactly how I thought it would. If you watch me throughout the week, I almost nailed the score down to the point. I had, what I have, 24-20, something like that, 25-22. I never thought for a second this game would result in a final that, that had more than a one-score margin. There was no way. The Chiefs haven't been playing that type of football. And lately, throughout the playoffs here, neither had the Niners, which was very odd because if you watch the regular season, the Niners were beating the hell out of everyone until all of a sudden, late De uh, December rolled around, they took that beating against the Ravens, took that type of vibe, I guess, into the playoffs, and nothing felt quite right. They really should have lost in the divisional to the Packers, got out of there alive. They really should have lost to the Detroit Lions in the NFC Championship. Still don't have no idea how the hell they pulled that one off. Skin of their teeth, survive. I never for a second thought that that team, based on what we had saw in the playoffs, was capable of going into the Super Bowl and just running away with it against the Chiefs, like the Tampa Bay Bucks did in 2020 with Tom Brady. There's just no way I foresaw it. And I also never foresaw the Chiefs just blowing anybody out either. It's not who they had been all year. It's not who they were in the playoffs. They've been playing a type of football that just allows them to find a way. And really that's exactly what it was yesterday. And when you mix together the little things, the little things that all culminate to success, that's what the Kansas city chiefs do. Because even in a game where Patrick Mahomes throws a interception, which he rarely does in the playoffs, throws an interception on the wrong side of his own 50, where his team fumbles the ball five times, including one well within the 10-yard line from Isaiah Pacheco. I, I marvel in the ability to somehow do everything to lose a game including carve yourself a deficit, turn the ball over. And even when you're not turning the ball over, sloppy, right? They didn't turn the ball over on all five of those fumbles. I think they only lost one. But uh, you, you fumble the ball five times. You throw that interception. Every snap the entire night for, to Mahomes was on the floor. Mahomes at one point near the, half, the, uh, the halftime show was, was five of six. They weren't even throwing the football but the Niners couldn't put him away and no one ever can. The Ravens couldn't do it. The bills couldn't do it. And the, the Niners last night had every opportunity in the world. That offense didn't do anything the entire first half, but it doesn't matter. You know, you pick off Mahomes, you get nothing out of it. You get down to the red zone multiple times. You can't get in the end zone. You settle. 
Christian McCaffrey, right? One of the best backs of our generation. Never, ever fumbles the football. Fumbles the football. Right? Mahomes is going to get all the credit. And almost deservingly so. They're not where they're at today without him. They're not even close to where they're at today without him. And of course, he wins his third Super Bowl MVP. All three championships they've won, he's been the MVP. But you look back at yesterday, and you look at all the things that went wrong, and then all the things that they had to do in order for it to go right. And that's what ultimately sets this team apart between the entire rest of the NFL. And this is why immediately after the Bills lost to the Chiefs in the divisional, and everyone's crying, right? Fire McDermott. Oh, we got to reload, you know, trade Stephon Diggs. We got to find a new OC. Ken Dor- uh, Joe Brady isn't going to be it. Nobody played these Chiefs better. And I'm, I'm not sure it was particularly close than these Buffalo Bills throughout the last month of football here in these playoffs. And we bitch and moan that the Bills can't get over the hump. Nobody has beaten these Chiefs more in the last three years than the Bills. The sad fact of the matter is they can't beat them in the playoffs. Neither can anybody else. You think we got it bad as Bills fans? Losing to them three times in the playoffs? Imagine being Niners fans, losing to them twice in the Super Bowl, where you had a 10-point lead in both games, and you almost unarguably had the better team. You can't argue to me yesterday that based on the on the squad on paper, the Niners were not the far and away more talented team. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So we bitch and moan nonstop, right? We got to do this. We got to do that. So does, so does 30 other teams outside of the Bills. Nobody does it. The Ravens were the best team in the league. Couldn't do it, right? We all know the, the, the Dolphins really never stood a chance in the wild card, but still, you know, couldn't, couldn't score more than a touchdown. So it, it's, it's an utter mind F. It, there's really no other way to put it. Because you're watching these games, and, and, and we feel this way. I feel this way every time. You're watching, and you're like, you know, that team is not that much better than their opponent. If anything, there's times where they look inferior, and that's the most frustrating thing. I mean, there were times for the Patriots where they were just, it was, it was almost unfair. Weirdly enough, the time in which they were the best they ever were was in 07 when they lost to the Giants. I mean, that was the team that that went 18 and 0. They were outscoring teams by almost 20 points a game at some at one point. There was utter dominance on display multiple times throughout that dynasty. Not that there wasn't for the Chiefs or hasn't been for the Chiefs, I should say. But I, I don't know. It, it, it's never really felt like that. This year no more than than any of the other years though. I mean, th- this was the year this was the year. You couldn't really name anybody else on that defensive line outside of Chris Jones. You got a really young defense in general, which, by the way, unbelievable. You know, you 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 jump the Bills in the draft to draft Trent McDuffie, and, and he's only the he, he he's only a first team All Pro. <laughs> Legarius Sneed, one of the one of the best in the game now. So it it doesn't matter. You lose Tyreek Hill. You you lose. I mean, you want to talk about somebody that I, I laugh about, thinking about today because he's tweeting last night. He's like, yeah, 15 and read the best to ever do it. I'm like, dude, why? Why didn't you stay then? You get shipped off to Miami on your own volition, pretty much. Right. And they win two without you. Everybody thought you were the, the major puzzle piece to the success of the Kansas City Chiefs. They dish you to Miami. And they win two straight without you. And every and there's always the excuse, right? When they got rid of Tyreek Hill. Oh, they're going to fall off now. I'm hearing from my buddies. Oh, if the off chance Andy Reid decides to just go out on top. They're going to fall off without him. 
Are they? Because we have been given every reason to not think that that's going to happen. And then the little limited reasons we've been given to think it's going to happen, they've never mattered. Tyreek Hill, right, gone. Kelsey, almost non-existent through the, through the duration of this year. Doesn't matter. Turns it up to 11 in the playoffs. Completely off all year, this Chiefs team. Didn't matter. They're vulnerable. No, nope, didn't matter at all. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, pretty pedestrian season. Nope, doesn't matter. This defense did not allow more than 27 points once this entire year. And I think we wanted to say, oh, the Niners have the best defense. or The Ravens have the best defense. No, it, it really wasn't cl particularly close. The Chiefs had the best defense all year long. Saw a graphic this morning. That stat that I just shared with you, that, that is amongst the, the levels of the early 2000s Ravens and Tampa Bay Bucks and Pittsburgh Steelers. Like, just unprecedented shit. Right. And we look at it and, and, and like I was mentioning, Patrick Mahomes is going to get the majority of the credit. Welcome to the world of the quarterback, obviously. And I have really no problem with it. Like I said, they're never going to be where they're at today without him. But you just look at all the other things that they do that don't get talked about nearly enough because it's Kel it's the Kelsey show. What's Taylor Swift doing? It's the Mahomes show. It's the Andy Reid show. You don't talk about. The, the special teams. You don't talk about these young guys on defense who are just essentially taking over the entire team and willing them to victory, keeping them within the game long enough for Mahomes to do Mahomes things at the end of it. And that's really what a dynasty is all about. It's a collaborative effort. It's a joint effort to come together and win these things. And that's what I think gets lost a lot when it comes to talking about these Chiefs. Not that they don't get enough talking about, believe me. You know, I sat today and, you know, it didn't matter what you did. Right? I did it all. Radio, TV, had it all going. And it's exactly what you expected. And it's what it's going to be. Now, you know, it would have been one of two things. I almost find that this might be better. Because if the Niners would have won, we would have had to hear all morning about how Brock Purdy's the next Tom Brady, which just it, 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 it couldn't be farther from the truth. But that would have been that would have been the discourse this morning in the entire offseason. We would have had to hear that. At least they already know how good the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes are. So you can almost stomach hearing that because you've been hearing it for over half a decade now. But now we're approaching we're approaching rare air here. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, and that's what starts to get sick because I think people were apprehensive to discuss the dynasty talk because they hadn't won three yet. That apparently, I don't know who, I don't know who the gatekeeper of the dynasties are who sat around and said, okay, well, you're not considered a dynasty until you win three in X amount of time, but it doesn't, I mean, they've done that. So people really weren't having that full on discussion just yet because for whatever reason, the, the three, Super Bowls is the um that that is the secret password to get in to the dynasty club. But now that that has happened, it's all you're going to hear. And I mean rightfully so. Cuz this is how I felt last night and, and and I was I was I'm torn, right? This is a very odd spot to be in. So, uh, I I had a ton of money on the Chiefs. I, I look at this game and I, I think I shared it with you guys. I said, you know, when it comes to the Super Bowl, that's my, when it comes to the Super Bowl, obviously I never get to watch my bills in it, right? Ever, 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 ever. So it's a yearly tradition. It's, you know, the, the, the tale is old as time, a tradition unlike any other. And we'll talk about another one of those in a little bit. That's the halftime show. Talk about that in a little bit. But a tradition unlike any other in the Bell household. Pick the team you hate the least, root for them, and if it comes down to the point where you really have a tough time even picking one of those, we're just going to be hammering bets, and that's what we're going to be rooting for. I wiped the floor yesterday, destroyed the slate, killed it. 13-2, and two. knock on wood, because you don't get many of those days often, believe me, destroyed it. So, all over the Chiefs. And my reasoning was for no other reason other than 15 was on one sideline and the other sideline didn't have that. And, and people sit around, and I do it too throughout the regular season because it matters. The advanced analytics, especially when it comes to these little nuances in the betting market, you look into those things, you read into those things. They do help. Don't, don't get me wrong. 
You throw all of that out in this scenario, though. I didn't look into a damn thing. The defensive rankings, right? The deeper analytical stats, the offense and how they match up against the Chiefs, the defense and how they match up against the Chiefs, vice versa. I threw it all out. I went all in because I knew one side had it and the other one has the opposite. Because let's let's be honest, the, the San Francisco 49ers have just become an elite level of the Dolphins and the Cowboys. That's really what they are. Because the Dolphins and the Cowboys, you know at some point the choke is on the horizon. It's just usually either in the regular season or very early in the postseason. It's a unique spot for these Niners to be in because they're in the exact same boat, but you're not going to get the choke until the NFC Championship or the Super Bowl. And I don't know how they're dealing with that in the Bay Area as fans. I mean, at least we can stomach it knowing we didn't get all the way there. Because I don't know how I'm sitting today if that's the Bills in the Niners spot, where you have a double-digit lead. You really could argue you outplayed them the entire game. I don't know. And Kyle Shanahan essentially said the same. I don't know if what you really could have done differently as far as a strategic standpoint is concerned other than probably running the ball more which they they seemingly did not emphasize in the second half Christian McCaffrey's your best player on the on the field you would you wouldn't have guessed it based on the way Sh- Shanahan was was dialing things up but I think that that's what the Chiefs do to you you get so panicked that you essentially just start throwing the ball and doing uncharacteristic things because you feel like you have to And the only reason I say that is because it happens every time. That's why I was so admired by what the Bills did against them in the divisional. They didn't go, they really didn't go away from what they were doing all game because it was working. They didn't go down the the road of, we got to let Allen just throw the ball 50, 60 times. You know, we got to air it out. We got to go try to score as quick as possible. Like they stuck to their guns and that was run the ball, keep the ball in our hands and try to win the win it that way. And they had the best crack out of anybody. But the Ravens last week, one of the best rush teams of my lifetime, completely bail on the run, completely bail on it, almost to the point of, like, everyone's questioning Harbaugh because of it. And then last night, they had established a pretty decent run element in the first half, the Niners did. And then you really didn't hear a whole lot from McCaffrey later on in the game. And I think that that's just what the psychological damage um, – is you know that's the result of playing these chiefs in these big games you just sort of go away from what your identity is but i thought outside of not feeding mccaffrey more in the second half they they played well enough to win that game and i really don't know from a strategic standpoint how much more you can do that's going to be able to to offset a muffed punt on your own 10 right and uh it, like, 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 essentially, these little things throughout the game—a blocked field, a blocked extra point. Like, there's nothing as a coach that's really going to be able to to mitigate that, right? So, you go and I go into that game yesterday, and I'm just thinking of all these things. And I'm like, there's no other reason for me to, to to bet on anybody but but Mahomes right now because I have gone the opposite every time. I have bet against the the Chiefs with the Bills probably every single time they've played. Now, granted, I'm even on it, right? I'm three and three. That's what their record sits at. But in the big ones, big offer, right? I bet on them probably every time they play the Chiefs in the playoffs. Loss. By the way, I don't recommend. No, just don't bet on the Bills. If you want to add insult to injury, do that. And I'm really good at doing that. I'm I'm really good at just pumping a little salt in that wound. Believe me. Nothing worse than losing in the playoffs to the Chiefs and also looking at your bank statement afterwards and having that take a nice nice hit too because of it. That's always nice. But so last night, I'm like, look, at he's 10-1-1 against the spread. No other reason to do it than that. So I, I go all in, and I'm pacing around. I'm tweaking out because they really should have lost that game. And I'm like, dude, this is unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, it clicks. You know, it clicks. When, right around probably the muff punt where it's just like something's going to, they're going to find a way. They're just going to find a way. I, I don't know how, I don't know when they're going to do it. And that's exactly what happened. So what I'm getting at here is goes really well for me from that standpoint where you're like, all right, you know, now the Super Bowl, last game of the year, you crush it on the, uh, on the betting market. And then you're, you, I, I don't really bet on many other sports. So, you know, you, 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 you ride that into the sunset to next year. So you're excited about that. But then when you sit back, 
because if you're like me, if you've been gambling on sports forever, like you're you're used to the highs and the lows. So you take the the high, like oh hell yeah, and then you know it's not like you sit all night thinking about oh man what a what a job you did, kid. It's not how it works. So you sit down and you and you're, you you win, but then you're watching the post game. And then it hit me where like, I don't, you know, once that's done and over with, and you know, you won, it hit me where I'm like, man, I don't even care about that anymore because at what cost, at what cost I'm sitting there, these guys are all getting interviewed. And I don't know if you guys watched all the post game stuff and the vibe you had around it, but you're watching these guys get interviewed. And I, I don't know why it felt this way. Maybe it's because it, it, it was exactly this. All the guys getting interviewed, it's almost like they don't even give a shit. It's so commonplace. It's a routine interview. I mean, Chris Jones is sitting down with NFL Network afterwards. He's as sturdy as a fence post, just sitting there. Yeah, you know, just, I mean, it, it was like business as usual. Uh, yeah, this is great. Another ring in the trophy. When's next year's start? Sitting down with all these guys. The only guy that really seemed starstruck was probably Nicole Hardman because he caught the game-winning touchdown, and he was a jet before he joined the Chiefs. I'd be a little starstruck, too, if I was him. I mean, you want to talk about hitting the lottery. You want to talk about the biggest gambler, uh, the, the biggest uh, a winner in Vegas last night, Nicole Hardman. I mean, how do, you, how do you get better than getting shipped to the Chiefs from the Jets and catching the game-winning touchdown in overtime for those Chiefs. You're hitting the mega millions right there. But you're sitting back and you're watching this and you're just almost sick to your stomach where you're like, I, I can't believe they're doing this again. Like to the point where you're sitting there and it's just so commonplace to watch the red and yellow confetti hit the, hit the floor to watch these guys just say the same shit they say every year at the podium and at in these interviews and you're just sick cuz I'm thinking to myself man if the bills are at the the interview here I mean there's not there's not a dry eye in the house with these chiefs it's just like yeah number 3 so after the the excitement settles of of, of doing uh you know of of winning the the super bowl bets you almost just are, are resentful you're like, oh my God, at what cost, bot? At what cost? Because this is now, this is now the f official changing of the guard. And that's exactly what last night was. It felt like it because it is exactly what it was. There was always a vibe about New England where no matter what was going on, you just felt like Brady was going to win the game every time. That, of course, is why those giant Super Bowl victories are so miraculous for Eli Manning and, and a team that was a wild card team, not nearly talented to the level of, of the Patriots going and win. Like you, you couldn't fathom Brady was losing that game because in every other situation for his entire career, essentially, he won those games every time. And it was it didn't matter. Right. It didn't matter whether you were down 28 to three or Russell Wilson's on the inch line and a touchdown wins the game. It doesn't matter. They win, right? The little things, the little things. Like, for instance, Kyle Shanahan drawing up a pass for Matt Ryan in a situation where if they would have just taken a, have taken a knee, they could have kicked the field goal. That game would have been over. But he gets sacked, and it changes the whole game because they can't score again, and the Patriots never look back. They win the game. It's the little thing. It's the little things, right? Drawing up the defense from Malcolm Butler against the Seahawks with a read that 100% identifies that slant route that they ran. They had ran that play all year to success, and Belichick had a counter for it. Malcolm Buck Butler executed the defense to literal perfection and made one of the greatest plays in Super Bowl history picks the ball off on the inch line, and they win it. It was a combo of incompetent coaching on one side and genius coaching on the other side. And that, along with one of the greatest, if not the greatest quarterback, I don't know why I'm saying if not one of, he is, uh, that, that discourse has to take a break for a second. The Mahomes-Brady talk. I understand it. If anything, I understand it's almost fair at this point to have the conversation. I don't want to have the conversation, but we can't. People are crowning it. And that that's a problem. We're so blinded by recency bias that even though Brady's been out of the league for one year, we can't stand not crowning somebody else as the best of all time. Like we just love to do that. 
we can't do that yet. But if anybody's on on pace to do it, I mean, my God, right? So you combine all those things, and that's what led to the Patriots doing what they did for 20 years. And you look at the Chiefs now, and they're doing the exact same thing. They got the quarterback to do it, the coach to do it, and then it's just these little things here and there that they do in the big game that the other team doesn't ever, that they'll always out-execute you in, and they'll win it. So that was my only real reason in going into the game yesterday. Like these little things, the game, I knew the game was going to be close. I knew it was going to come down to the wire. And I feel like if you knew the same, which you probably should, you're all diehard football fans. You all watch the sport outside of just the bills. You know, you knew what that game was going to be. I mean, I don't know how you didn't know. I don't know how, if you are as diehard of a fan as the next guy, how you don't know that last night's game, whether win or lose for the Chiefs, that game was going to be what it was, down to the last second, in this case, goes to overtime. And if you are that type of fan, and if you are that cognizant of what that game was going to be, because it's what every Chiefs game like that is, all you had to do was go walk in your bathroom or your bedroom, wherever you got your biggest mirror in the house, and look at it and say, just say it to yourself. If that happens, if this game comes down to a two-minute drill in the Super Bowl, if this game comes down to a two-minute separation between playing the game and holding the trophy afterwards, who do you see holding that trophy at the end? Brock Purdy or Patrick Mahomes? And when you slap yourself back into reality and realize there was never a question to begin with, when you look at yourself and almost laugh because you can't believe you had any other thought process other than the lone correct answer, you go and place your bets on the Chiefs. You go and tell everybody you're, you're picking the Chiefs. That's really all it came down to. And it's crazy because no other team can say the same in that situation. Because even for the Bills, I like to say that every week because I think it's somewhat true. I got 17. I'm going to win the game. But... This is the problem, and this is the biggest difference, and this is what I'm trying to get at when it comes to these Chiefs and why it's really a dynasty. A dynasty isn't just one player, and it never was just Tom Brady. He was just the biggest piece of an incredibly masterful puzzle. That's exactly what Mahomes is, and I'd argue he's almost even a bigger piece than Brady just because of his ability to do other things that I don't think Brady was capable of. But it's the other elements of the team that get overlooked because the quarterback overshadows all those other little things. That's why they're so comparable. The defense is now comparable. The coaching is comparable. The quarterback play is comparable. And now, of course, the hardware in the trophy room is on pace to be comparable. And... uh and, and, and when you look back this year, th this is the year that has to feel the worst if you're a fan of the Bills, if you're a fan of the Ravens, if you're a fan of the Dolphins, if you're a fan of really anybody relevant in this league, because this was the year to get them. This was the year. You can't tell me otherwise. I know that they say they believe in themselves the whole year. Of course they did. Why wouldn't they? They're the damn Chiefs. I should have too. I guess we all should have. We all look like idiots today. But they gave us every reason to not buy into them. And I don't regret any thoughts I had about this team throughout the year. They did not look good. They lost five of eight at one point. I always go back to the Christmas Day game because, folks, we're not talking about week one where the Bills shit themselves against the Jets. And you're like, what the hell was that? I mean, sometimes it, it takes a little bit to get your feet underneath you in this league throughout the course of a year. That's not the case come Christmas time. You either got it or you don't. I mean, we're, we're two weeks removed here from playoff ball. You're either, you're either in shape for it or you're not. And they got the doors blown off them by a Raiders team who didn't throw a ball. They didn't throw a pass after the, what, the midway through the second quarter? I say it all the time. It's almost like a stick of mine at this point. Aiden O'Connell was 7 of 12 in that game for 70 yards. And they beat him going away at home with the biggest audience of the day on Christmas Day. 
And then you're sitting there, and this is, mind you, this is just this was the culmination of a, of a bunch of other games throughout the year where they did, they did not look good. Borderline bad at times. And it was so hard for me to think, look, it, if they did not have the ability to do it in that moment or other moments throughout the year, I'm just supposed to sit back and think that they can magically do it because the postseason starts. It's still the same sport, right? Against similar opponents, better opponents. And this time you're on the road. I'm sorry, I can't buy into it. And they would go on to rattle off, according to the advanced analytics, the most improbable most difficult Super Bowl run in the history of the sport. According to the advanced analytics, the run that they had to go on, beating Miami, beating Buffalo on the road, beating Baltimore on the road, and then beating the Niners, three uh, or two one seeds, right? A two seed and a three seed, or whatever the hell the Miami was. It doesn't matter the seeding. It's based on a variety of things like strength, the schedule for the, for the team, their stats throughout the year, you divvy it all up. And it was the most improbable, most difficult run ever. And it's even, it was even more difficult according to these numbers than what the giants did in 07, which I personally think was the most insane thing I've ever seen, but that just goes to show you. And that's what makes all of us just lose that much more hope. Not that you had a whole lot left in the tank anyways. And everybody always wants to think it's the bill. It's a it's a Bills problem. It's a league problem, folks. It's not a Western New York problem. It is a 31 franchise wide problem. They all face it. How do we stop 15 in red and the rest of the bunch? Because nobody can do it. And if you are a fan of one of these relevant teams in the AFC right now, or hell the NFC, because you're ultimately going to have to play him at the, in the big one. Anyways, you couldn't be more discouraged because this was the year to get them. This was the year to get them. They were the, they were the worst they had been, especially offensively. That's the biggest key here. I think the defense was overlooked so much throughout this year for the chiefs because of how bad their offense really was. So they're there for the taken and they're on the road for these playoffs. Right? Something they haven't done. And Kelsey hadn't done anything. They're dropping balls all year long. They're barely able to crack 20 points. I mean, guys, if they won it this year, I mean, where do you glean the hope from? I, the my silver lining, and it's sickening and sad because you have to have one. But I, I, I don't think I have to look very far. I just watched the Chiefs go and, and do the most difficult Super Bowl run of all time, right? The Bills played them going away, far and away, bar none, the best. And the unfortunate reality, okay, is that the Chiefs, how many games they play this year? 21 games, okay? Chiefs played 21 games this season. They played their best game, and it wasn't particularly close against the Bills in the divisional. They played their best game in that game. It wasn't close. Their best game wasn't last night. Their best game wasn't in the AFC Championship against the Ravens. Their best game wasn't in the brutal weather against the the, the, the Dolphins. It was against the Bills because, of course, it was. Of course, it was. Because I think if even last night, if they played the way that they do, the Bills win. They score 22 points, or they, they score uh, however many points in over, uh, regulation there, 19. I think if they played the way they, against, against, they did against the Ravens, not being able to score at all in the second half, I think the Bills win. And the Bills, it still remains the same as it did last week when we were talking about this. The Bills put up 24 points on them. Not a single other team in this playoff. Scored more than 22, right? Both one seeds they played, shut them down. The Ravens scored one touchdown. They didn't score again until a meaningless field goal at the end with Justin Tucker. They didn't do a damn thing. Last night, 
The Niners were settling for field goals all night long. One of their touchdowns had to come from a backwards pass from Jawan Jennings, which I swear to God, how that ball wasn't going 80 yards the other way, I'll never know. It was an absolute duck. It sat in the air for what felt like an hour. It looked terrible behind the line. It didn't even look open, and McCaffrey somehow grabs it and runs it in for a touchdown. That's the only reason they got one of their their lone two touchdowns last night. The Bills, I mean, man, they showed up. And I, I, I feel like I was on this from day zero when everybody was bitching and moment, moaning about the game plan the Bills put out there. I'm like, what else did you want? The game plan was phenomenal. It's just that it comes down to one or two plays against these guys, and the Bills didn't do it. The Ravens didn't do it. The, the Niners didn't do it. Nobody does it. The Bills did it the best. They were the only team out of all of these teams. They were the only team that felt like they had a legitimate chance at the end to just win it and end it right there. Right? You could argue the Niners did, but did it ever really feel like they were going to go down and ice that game? The Bills were willing their way down the field that final drive the entire time, and then they just stalled out. The two throws, the two Poor, poorly executed, poorly drawn up, in my opinion, throws at the end, including the, the the rush to James Cook where you just ran him into a wall. That was that was your game. That was your game. I'm looking it up right now just to show you. I'm not just saying this. I'm not just saying the Chiefs gave their best game to the Bills. They, they actually, according to the numbers, 100% did. And it's via my man Aaron Schatz. Shout out. My man, Aaron Schatz, if you missed our shows on Friday about the MVP discourse, make sure to go and check those out, especially the one with Rico and I. We went for about three hours and we just let her rip. That was fun as hell. I needed that. And we talk a lot about my man, Aaron Schatz, on that episode because, of course, he is the lone soldier who was brave enough to go and vote for somebody other than Lamar Jackson. I apologize to Stephen A. I know that's such a... a, a, a um, a soft or whatever you want to call it, a, a very touchy subject for him to talk about anybody who would be willing to do that. Cause of course they're, they're just massive cowards and they're shameful and they should be banned from ever being involved with the league. But I, I happen to think a little bit differently. God forbid. Uh, and Aaron chats was, was one of the, was, was the lone guy. So here are the numbers just to let you know that I'm not pulling this out of my ass as far as, Hey, the, you know, the, the, the chiefs really did save their best game for the bills because of course they did. Cause it's the bills. I mean, obviously of course they did, but they legitimately did. Okay. So here's the numbers via Aaron chats based on DVOA. The resurgence of the chiefs offense in what is one game. That's it. Because right, if you remember right after the Bills game, everybody's like, play off Mahomes, right? Kelsey's back. Mahomes is back. The Chiefs are back. And Aaron Chats is saying, if you base it on the numbers, this, this Chiefs offense, the resurgence of it, it really isn't in, in existence. It just happened to happen this one game and this one game only. He'd go on to say, quote, their best offensive game of the year was against Buffalo. The week before, the Chiefs had zero offensive DVOA against Miami and 62% defensive DVOA, essentially meaning they played a near-perfect game on defense. The offense was okay, but it was enough to win. But in the game against the Bills, according to those numbers, it was their best game of the season. So people look at that, and they walk away, and they think it's a Bills problem. They think it's the Bills' fault. I mean, sure, some of it is. It's not like they're not at fault. You know, you throw a better ball to Khalil Shakir in the end zone. Maybe you hit Stephon Diggs on the crossing pattern. Maybe if you make a field goal at the end, things are different. But you saw last night, they're probably not because the Niners make a field goal. And, and how they were in field goal range within 40 seconds. And they even had a chance on the, uh, on the Niners' eight-yard line to score a touchdown before regulation ended. So the field goal wouldn't have mattered. We all knew it wouldn't have. But wouldn't it have been nice to at least known for sure that it didn't matter, right? But at the end of the day, this is almost, it, it goes back to, it, it's funny. We watch these playoffs play out, and the same thought I had after the Bills-Chiefs game is the same thought I had today. 
You feel good about the fact that the Bills played them about as well as anybody could possibly play them in that situation, and they very well should have won it. You feel like shit because you feel hopeless in the sense that you can you couldn't have really done a whole lot better, and you still lose. And that's exactly how all of these teams probably feel, and that's still how you feel today because they do it against everybody. It's not just the Bills. I mean, you don't think Niners fans are sitting around today thinking about the one or two plays. You don't think Niners fans are sitting around today saying, if that punt doesn't happen to land on the shin of a returner, bounce awkward, uh, awkwardly to Ray Ray McLeod, who double fumbles it, and the Chiefs take over on the Niners 10 and score the next play. You don't think they're sitting around saying we win the Super Bowl today if we get that? You don't think they're sitting around today saying if if Brock Purdy doesn't get absolutely massacred by the Blitz on third and four late in the game, we can ice this game and, and win it in regulation. You know, you don't you don't think they're thinking if Brock Purdy doesn't get absolutely blown up by Chris Jones. You go back and look at that play in overtime. Nobody blocked one of the best rushers in the league in the league wide open it was either Ayuk or Debo Samuel he didn't have a prayer I know everybody wants to get on Brock Purdy's ass today go back and look at some of these attempts with the blitz I mean guys it wouldn't have mattered if Thanos was back there you know it really wouldn't have mattered it wouldn't have mattered if you had Iron Man back there shooting the football out of the out of the lasers in his hands I mean, the guy didn't have a prayer. Spagnola, what more can you say about the guy? Is it the best we've ever seen on the defensive coordinator end of things? He had an answer for everything. I mean, they had their chances, the Niners. They had them. They were right there. But it's the little things, these blitzes. And they did the same thing against the Bills. Don't you remember the Khalil Shakir throw? Tony Romo got blasted for having, you know, the gall to say that Chris Jones interrupted the throw from Allen on that. I remember I had every Dolphins fan uh, in South Beach on my ass because God forbid you figure the guy who's got the strongest arm in the league might have short skipped a 20 yard throw because he got hit. Not because his arm is a noodle arm. I know you guys are well versed in noodle arms in South Beach. Believe me, I know you are experts in that topic. But that wasn't the result. That wasn't the 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 uh, the driving force behind the reason the throw was on the ground. Chris Jones blew up Dawkins and interrupted it. And he did the same damn thing yesterday in overtime to Brock Purdy, which on a what would have been wide open touchdown throw. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? They just got it and they do it every time. I mean, you don't think they're sitting around today saying all that? The Niners fans, I sure as hell would be. Hell, I'm sitting here today like a damn loser three weeks after that Bills game still conjuring up bullshit to talk to talk myself into the, into the thought process of us winning that game. You don't think Ravens fans are sitting around saying if Zay Flowers doesn't get one of the most ridiculous personal fouls in the league this year and then proceeds to fumble the ball in the end zone, you don't think they're sitting around saying, man, I think we win that game. If Lamar Jackson doesn't throw a pick into triple coverage for God knows what reason, maybe we win that game. And that's why the Chiefs are the Chiefs, because they leave us all sitting around Monday saying we had that. If we would have done this, if we would have done that, and it's usually not that many things. It's one, two, three things. If we would have done this, that, and this, we win that game. But here's the difference, folks. They, the Chiefs don't allow you to do it, and they do it. That is the difference. It's not a Mahomes thing, certainly a contribution. Of course, right? Because you knew in overtime last night, you knew the second they brought Jake Moody out on that field in overtime, if you're a KC fan, start going, start ordering your merch, right? Start planning your travel plans for the parade because this ball game's over. You're going to kick a field goal there and let Mahomes get the ball back with a touchdown separating him from a, from a Super Bowl? You better start booking your hotel and your flight because we're going on a parade, baby. Downtown KC, we're partying. He's certainly the biggest piece, but there's all these other things. And they just do it. And nobody else does. 
and they leave everybody sitting around the next day on the podcast, at the barbershop, talking with their dad. And this is what everyone's doing. Everyone's on the phone. Man, you know, if Chris Jones doesn't hit Josh Allen, Khalil Shakir catches it. If Chris Jones doesn't get all up in Brock Purdy's face, they score a touchdown in overtime. Things might be different. If Zay Flowers doesn't fumble the ball out of the bounds and Legereus Sneed makes the play of the year maybe and makes him fumble the ball on the inch line, who knows where we're at today? Every fan base is doing it. We might all wear different jerseys. We might all have different accents. We might all have a different creed when it comes to who we're rooting for, but we all share one same sentiment, and that's on Monday after playing the Chiefs. We're going to get on the phone. We're going to get behind the mic. We're going to get in the barbershop chair, and we're all going to be saying we could have had it. We should have had it. We did have it, but you didn't have it, and they did every single mother effing time. Let's talk about, I mean, there's so many things to talk about. There really is so many things to talk about in this game. Let's transition to just real quickly what I felt to be the major differences in the game, right? I keep talking about these little things. These little things. To me, it really is what it, it's all that it, that it is. I mean, obviously, you go and look at the box score, and you're never going to turn down a 300 plus yard day from Mahomes, right? And not for anything, you know, you're never going to turn down his ability to run the ball like the best of them last night. I mean, that was almost the most impressive thing about what he did yesterday. We all know what he's capable of doing through the air. You're expecting it. But the guy had 67 yards right on the ground and the majority of them were just high IQ scrambles in the most necessary situations. And of course, the one drawn up run was just so unbelievably gorgeous. I mean, it was just, oh, it was a work of art. Fourth and one in in overtime. You're in the gun, which I always hate. I hate going in the gun in that situation. But foot in mouth for me, man, because you're in the gun. And, and this is the beauty almost of, of Mahomes' running ability. With Allen and Jackson, right, you almost see it coming. Now, good luck stopping Josh Allen on a one-yard run. You're really not gonna do you're rarely gonna do it. But the defense more than more than likely is is cognizant of the fact that that's probably what's coming. Doesn't mean you're gonna stop it, but you know it's coming. With with Mahomes, that's really not how they use him. You're rarely seeing him dial up a designed run and that's why it hits you by surprise and they run this design run yesterday on that fourth and one where it's a play action fake he bootlegs out to the right and he's got a wide open hole and it, i mean it's it was the easiest first down of the night for him in the most crucial spot so you look at the box stats for him and yeah i mean it's what you would expect certainly but it's the little things like that that maybe you don't fully expect from Mahomes and the Chiefs that just somehow happened. I thought out of everything Mahomes did last night, the most impressive thing of them all was his scrambling and ground ability in the biggest moments of the game. I know he's one of the better scramblers that they're, that we've seen, just as far as just sheer ability to scramble. I'm not talking about run. There's a difference. He's one of the more elusive quarterbacks I've ever seen. I've always compared him to like literally a wet seal. Like just a, an oiled up entity. I, I've never understood the inability to tackle the guy. Because y you look at the picture of him in the locker room, right? He's the, the, the dad bod king. He, he, he moves around like this. He walks around like this, right? Every time he runs, it looks like he's got something in his pants. No one can tackle the guy. It, it, it's it's um it, it is like the eighth wonder of the world because you watch him run and it doesn't look like Allen or Jackson or any of the greats. The result seemingly is always the same. No one can hit the guy. They can't tackle him. I don't get it. Nine carries for sixty six yards yesterday on, on an average of seven yards per carry. Thirty four of forty six. You know, I'm, I'm even shocked you threw it forty six times because that hasn't been their recipe for winning. They've been having him throw the ball sub 30 times to get these victories. But that to me was the little aspect of his game 
where I thought you don't typically see it, but you saw it, and it was a it was a hell of a a, a hell of a um, factor in, in in why they won, especially late. But let's go outside of the fact that he leads the two most crucial drive, the two or three most crucial drives of the game, because that really was the difference. Purdy goes down, they settle for field goals. Mahomes goes down, he's going to win the game, right? Goes down right before the end there, gets, gets in field goal range with ease, really almost could have won it in regulation. You expect all that. But to me, what this defense, and this is one of the little things, what this defense did in the pass rush was nuts. It didn't always result in a sack. In fact, I don't even think Chris Jones had a sack yesterday. But there were so many plays that felt like they were going to be the the dagger. The play that was going to really solidify the game for the Niners. And the pressure just got home. I talked about it a little bit earlier. The third and four. This, to me, was the biggest of them all. Because I think even if you score a touchdown in overtime, as we saw, the Chiefs scored in overtime too. Who knows if that actually wins you the game. But third and four, right, late in the game, the Chiefs were on the ropes. The Niners were having their best drive of the second half by a long shot. And they're going down the field. They're chipping down the field. They're chipping down the field. And they start at their own 25. And they get all the way down. Uh, in, in the field goal range. And it's third and four. Now, mind you, these are the situations all night long that the Chiefs have been executing. This is the biggest difference. You send the blitz against Mahomes, you better say a prayer because there's always going to be someone on a check down, whether it's Kelsey or Pacheco. There's always somebody there and they're executing. Like even in overtime, they had a third and six, execute. Fourth and one, execute. They were executing every single time. And really, the, the Niners only had to do it one time to ice this game. The, the Chiefs have, had done it several times. They just had to do it one time. And they couldn't. And they didn't have a prayer in doing it. So they run the ball first to start the, the, the drive off. This to me is where things got a bit interesting when it came to the mindset of the Niners. On this particular play I'm talking about, the series of downs sets up at first and 10 at the KC 40. The way Moody had been kicking the ball, you're essentially already in field goal range. I want to tip my cap to that kid, by the way. He had, had a very shaky year as a rookie kicker. Dude, in the Super Bowl as a rookie kicker, nailing two 50-plus yard field goals, I was thoroughly impressed. I feel god-awful about the extra point. We'll talk about that in a second because that's one of the little things. But, man, I, I-, I thought he was missing both those field goals by a mile just before he kicked it, and uh, I was stunned. He really kept them in the game despite maybe ultimately <laughs> losing them the game. But they run the ball with CMC to start this series off. And this is kind of a microcosm of this game. First and 10, they run it with CMC. You got three and a half minutes on the clock. You're at the KC 40. This is dream scenario right now. Dream scenario. If you're the Niners. Because it's 16 all. You're on the right side of the 50. And we're about to hit the two-minute warning here. If we get a first down, either the Chiefs got to burn all their timeouts or we can ice this thing down to the final seconds, send Moody out there and put this one in the history books. You run it on first and 10, five-yard gain. They would proceed to throw it the next two downs. Let's go and look at the box stat to give you an understanding of what I'm talking about. Christian McCaffrey, folks, Offensive Player of the Year, if you haven't heard, and deservingly so. One of the best running backs I've ever seen in my life. 
I, I, I just, I, he, he's got to be one of my favorite non bills in this league. I just love everything about Christian McCaffrey. I love him. I love him. And he's the best player on that team by a wide margin on, on offense. And that's saying something because this offense is loaded up. Brock Purdy threw the ball 38 times last night, eight attempts shy of a first ballot Hall of Famer on the other side of the, uh, of the field. Is that what I want to do if I'm Kyle Shanahan when I got the Offensive Player of the Year in the backfield? And I also, by the way, have Debo Samuel, who's one of, if not the greatest gadget guy in the last decade. The dude is a Swiss Army knife. Everything he does, he does well, including running the ball. They ran him three times for eight yards. Like there, there wasn't, it wasn't like there was a lack of the ability to be creative. The only touchdown they had of their two was Jawan Jennings throwing a, a pass from the opposite side of the field as a wide receiver. The creativity was there. It didn't feel like it was there enough. They didn't get Debo Samuel involved enough in the run game and really involved in enough at all. He finished with just over 40 total yards in the game. Now, granted, that's a huge credit to Kansas City's defense because they targeted him 11 times. And he had three catches. Two words. Sneed and McDuffie. Right? I mean, that doesn't get much better than that. But McCaffrey had 22 carries for 80 yards. An interesting stat there is going into that game, the Niners were 12-1 and one when McCaffrey had 75 yards or more on the ground. 12-2 and two today, of course. But it might look like a lot, right? 22 carries, 80 yards. But I feel like it almost had to be more. And whether it was McCaffrey or just more Elijah Mitchell and more Debo Samuel, so be it. Because you knew that was the weakness of the Chiefs. And granted, I thought they played pretty well against it yesterday. I think you still had the upper hand there, especially late. And you had just saw the prime example two weeks ago of the result that can happen if you go away from the run against these guys. It's going to burn you. The Ravens had the blueprint out. They stopped running the ball, and they got shut down the whole game. I mean, it, the writing was there for you. I don't know if I want Brock Purdy essentially throwing the ball 40 times in this game. 40 times. So now it's second and five on that series. I just got a five-yard gain from McCaffrey, and I know, or I should know, that I got two goals on this possession. And I think that they're both of equal value. I don't really value one more than the other, and that's insane because <laughs> just because it is. You're valuing time that you hold the ball, and you're valuing points. I say it's insane because it's very seldom you value time of possession as much as you value the points on the scoreboard. Welcome to playing the Kansas City Chiefs. It means the exact same because points here, unless it's a touchdown, is good for nothing, okay, unless the clock is damn near at zero because you know what they're going to do, and it's exactly what they ended up doing. So, you got the ball here, second and five after McCaffrey clips off a, a five-yard carry. And they proceed to throw the ball twice. And both of them are incompletions. And that is, you know, a, a, a terrible outcome for a couple of reasons. One, it just stops the clock. It stops the clock and it gives the Chiefs more timeouts in their arsenal on a drive to go down and either tie it or beat you. That's one. Two, you don't move the chains. You don't move the sticks. And I had, I had felt you just ran it for five yards with CMC. You, real, you know he's good for it. And I get, a I get a double bonus here. I get yards gained. Because they only shut him down at the line of scrimmage a couple times. I mean, McCaffrey's always going to get, he's, he's very rarely going to get tackled behind the line of scrimmage. They got him a couple times yesterday. I was impressed. Because I just thought that that wasn't a capability of this defense for the Chiefs. But of course, hey, they always find, they always find another way. But it's very rare you're going to get him behind the line multiple times. 
especially on one drive. So I got a second and five. And when the ball is snapped on second and five, folks, we're at, a, we're at two minutes, 45 seconds in the game. Right? So we get down to the two-minute warning on the third and five. And the reason that throwing the ball there is difficult is because even though we're at the two-minute warning, I have to throw now on third and five. I have to throw. And if I don't convert, that 90, that's 99% likely to result in also not making the Chiefs burn a timeout, right? Because I, I was I I was I misspoke. I, I should re-say they threw it to Kittle on that second and five. It wasn't an incompletion. I thought it was, but it was for no gain. But I guess the benefit of it was they did run the clock down to two minutes. So I, I apologize for that. But the problem that results from that is still the same. You're in a passing down now. If you run it on second down, you're very likely to put yourself in a scenario of at least third and three. McCaffrey just got five yards. Even at third and three with McCaffrey, you might consider running it again. But at third and five, you know for a fact that that's a passing down every single time. It has to be, especially in that moment of the game. Because you know if you don't get the field or the first down, you have to kick a field goal. So it puts you in a tough spot because if you have to throw the ball and you don't convert, no time run off the clock, no forced timeout burned by the Chiefs, and you have to kick the field goal. That's exactly what happened. But what would happen on that play defensively, I thought, when it comes down to these little things, was, was maybe the play of the game. And it was all thanks to Steve Spagnuolo, the defensive coordinator of the Kansas City Chiefs. They were doing what the Niners should not have been doing, and that's throwing the house at Brock Purdy in crucial throwing down situations. Third and five, and I mean, they unleash the dogs on Purdy. He didn't have a prayer. I don't care if there were seven guys wide open sitting down on the field waiting for a pop fly to come their way. Not a prayer. That defense was home in the blink of an eye. Purdy didn't have a chance. And that's why I go back to saying he didn't play particularly great at all, but he also was put in a really tough spot where I don't know how many people would have would have been able to, to overcome that. He, he really was under pressure in the biggest situations every time. That, to me, though, right there, might have been the play of the game. Because they send the house, it's perfectly planned, it's perfectly executed, and it forces an incompletion. So at the two-minute warning, I don't have to spend a timeout, no time comes off the clock, and they're kicking the field goal. And I know for 100% fact, with a minute 53 in timeouts in my belt, at the absolute bare bones minimum, we're tying this game, and we're going to overtime with 15 on the next possession. And that's what happened. If if the Niners get a first down there, folks, it's over. It's very likely over. It's very likely the Niners can ice this game. That was as big of a play as you saw all night last night. It doesn't really show up on the scoreboard, but it really ends up showing up on the scoreboard in different ways. They get that first down. I think we sit here today and we're talking about a whole different narrative. But they don't. And that's the little things that Patrick Mahomes has nothing to do with. That Andy Reid really has nothing to do with. That Steve Spagnola dialing up a blitz at the right time, knowing he's got the guys to do it, and they execute it. And you watched on the other side of things. And the Niners would dial up blitzes against Mahomes in similar scenarios. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? That's a backbreaker. The guy, they, they, they can beat that. And last night, the Niners couldn't. I think they were, what, 3 of 12 on third down? I mean, that's a huge indicator that you probably lost the game. And no bigger plays were on the, than were on. There were no bigger plays in the game than the ones that were not executed by the Niners on third down. That was one of them. And then, of course, the one in overtime. Right? The Niners were trying to do that all game long as well. I remember in, the, in overtime, they threw the house at Mahomes on a third and six, and he just dumped it off to either, Rashe, I think it was Rasheed Rice or Isaiah Pacheco, and it was like the easiest first down you'll, you'll ever see. 
you can't you can't do that, but you can do that against the Niners. And Steve Spagnuolo was very cognizant of that, right? So that to me, one of the little things that was really maybe the, the underrated play of the game. Let's go to a couple of special teams things before I get to the final defensive play in uh, in the um, in overtime that I think was ultimately the the other major play of the game. I always said I always say you, you, you got to have a little bit of luck to win these things. You have to. No one's ever won the Super Bowl based on sheer raw talent and talent alone. You need to have the ball bounce your way a little bit. I'm not saying you got to you got to be hitting the jackpot every night, but let's face it. You got to have a little bit of luck. Right? There's no way you you can you can win that many hard games in a row without a little bit of lady luck on your side. And God knows in Western New York, lady luck, she doesn't travel through Buffalo. Lady luck, not a fan of spending time in Western New York. Spends a fair share of time in Kansas City, however. And last night, Lady Luck, who's all around Vegas, either you got her on your side or you don't. I mean, that's for sure in that city. Chiefs had her on her on their side last night. Let's talk about the muffed punt. Because I once again, I sit here today and I say, I don't think we're talking about what we're talking about right now. If this doesn't happen. And it just once again, it's like, I, I don't like the Niners, right? How could I feel bad for the Niners? You've been here how many times, you know, you were one of the greatest dynasties back in the eighties, right? I mean, like you, you look back, how, how can I feel bad for the Niners? What was this? Your fourth consecutive AFC or NFC championship. You've been to the Super Bowl like three times in the last 15 years. I don't really feel bad for you. But I kind of do because I get it. This is one of those moments where you're you're sitting here today as a Niners fan and you just can't you can't fathom it. You can't wrap your head around giving them the chiefs of all people this advantage, this ability to just stay in the game like this. So let's go to where we're at in the ball game here. Okay. So we're in the third quarter, I believe, right? Yes, we're in the third quarter. Up until this point, and how quickly we forget, the Chiefs have done nothing, nothing offensively. When I say nothing, go back and, like I said earlier in the show, Mahomes near halftime was five of six at one point. Five of six. They took three points in the half. Three points. The same time last week, the week or two weeks prior, the Lions had 24 against these same Niners. Same team. They were, they were going all up and down the field on them. Right? And you're starting to wonder, you're starting to let it creep into your head a little bit. Are the Chiefs reverting back to what we've seen all year where they just don't have it? <laughs> and once again, it's just, it makes you laugh because you're like, oh, you're just waiting. Like, oh, this is it. This is it. They don't got it. Like, this is the, the Chiefs we've seen all year. Of course, of course, it was going to show its head back at some point, right? What happens? Three points at half, they come out of the half in Mahomes immediately. First drive of the half. Throws a pick. Throws a pick at their own 
23-yard line. He doesn't throw picks like this, folks. Not in games like this. He just doesn't do it. Third play of the second half. First down. Second down. Third down throws a pick on their own 23. A minute 20 into the second half. And this is where you pounce. But ultimately, this is where you lose the game. Another small thing in the game here that might have gone overlooked because of the ending and that'll overshadow everything. Mahomes throws a pick first series of the second half on their own 23. Chiefs have done nothing offensively and they're continuing to show at the start of the half year they got nothing. They got no answer. Nothing. And the Niners just did what most teams fail to do. That's turnover Mahomes. If you can do that, you're going to have a chance. You're going to have an additional deck in your card to be able to help you win this ball game. Right? So Mahomes throws the ball at the 23, but it's picked off at Kansas City's 44. Okay, fine. You still get the ball instantaneously in enemy territory. You're up 10-3, and the way way that this game was going up until this point, right, a a 17-3 lead for the Niners, it almost felt like it might have been insurmountable because, once again, the Chiefs couldn't even move the ball, much less score, and if the Niners were able to put up a 17-3 lead here, I mean, hell, even a 13-3 lead, you're not loving your chances because it's still the Chiefs, but you're liking where you're at because of what your defense is doing and you're continuing to build on the lead. So the Niners take over at the 44. And this to me right here, this has to be the drive. And there's got to be a, there's several moments in the game that Kyle Shanahan's going to want to back, going to want back. But I think this is the drive out of everything that happened last night, that Kyle Shanahan is going to want back the most, that he regrets the most. Why? Because he's the one calling the plays. He's not the one calling up a muffed punt. He's not the one calling up a blocked extra point, right? He's not the one that's calling up a Christian McCaffrey fumble. But he's calling plays for this team to be able to move the ball down the field and score on offense. And what they would proceed to do with this interception is embarrassing. And the reason I say that, it goes back to the point I was making earlier about McCaffrey and the point I was making about Brock Purdy throwing the ball in this game nearly 40 times. They get the ball at the 44-yard line. They don't gain a yard. In fact, they go backwards. You pick Mahomes off in the Super Bowl on the right side of the 50. Doesn't happen. You already have the lead. You're holding them to three. This is your chance to bury these sons of bitches. And what does Shanahan do? He dials up three pass plays. Three pass plays. McCaffrey wouldn't touch the ball on this drive once. Offensive player of the year, best player on your offense, and surely the difference maker when it comes to winning and losing this game based on how you execute with him. You're in a game, you're in the stage of the game now in the second half. I know it's early. You're not looking to, you know run the clock down to zero here. You're looking to run the clock. I don't give a damn if we're a minute and a half into the second half. You want to take this drive down to seven, six minutes in the in the third quarter, eight minutes. I mean, you want to take at least a couple damn minutes off the clock at minimum. How do you do that? I got an idea. Why don't I give the ball to the offensive player of the year in the backfield? Let him help move us down the field, and let's run this clock down. Three straight pass attempts by Brock Purdy. That was the game plan on this drive. Inexcusable. First and 10. Throw 
Incomplete. Second and 10. False start. Right? Throw again. Incomplete. Third down. You got to throw now, I guess, right? It's third and 15. Incomplete. You pick Mahomes off, you get the ball at the 44, and you end up finishing the drive at the 45. You don't even get a field goal attempt out of it, folks. If they would have gained six, seven yards, Moody's kicking a field goal, and based on the way he was ripping that leg last night, you'll like your chances. They run one minute, one minute off the clock and don't gain a yard. You get the Chiefs in rare territory, picking them off in the Super Bowl, being able to pounce, being able to, at the very bare minimum, take a two-score lead at the high end of things, take a 14-point lead. You, you, You evaporate a minute off the clock, and you don't gain a damn yard. And that's why I think if you're Shanahan, you look back today at that drive and you say, this is this is where it started to collapse for us. I think any points on that drive and we talk about maybe a different game today. Because it would continue the dominance by the the Niners uh, defense would continue. The next drive. The Chiefs don't do anything. Right? The Chiefs don't do shit. They go three and out. So after all this, you pick, they pick the Chiefs off. You don't do anything. But your defense comes out and forces another three and out again. But what happens? Well, what do you know? The same exact shit. That happened the series before. This portion of the game has to have Kyle Shanahan staring at his ceiling at night the next month, I would say. Guys, if you didn't think he learned his lesson from the previous series, maybe the excuse was, well, the false start happened, but you got to throw the ball. All right. Okay. Valid. Where's your excuse on this next drive? Picked off, three and out. You threw it three straight times. You didn't gain a yard. You blow a great field position. You punt it back. Defense comes out, forces another three and out. Okay, beautiful. Now we have our chance to run clock and add to this lead. First down, throw. Second down, throw. Third down, throw. This is now two series, two series, and Christian McCaffrey hasn't gotten a single handoff in the Super Bowl with a lead in the second half. They would go on to run off a minute and a half off the clock, not score a point and punt. I can't believe it. The ineptitude of these two drives has got to eat at Kyle Shanahan forever because the game was never the same after that sequence. After those two possessions by either team, the game was never the same and it was never going to be won by the Niners after that. And we'll get to the reason why in a second. But just even the first down situation, that's where you would assume you're going to run with McCaffrey, right? The first down of this series, oh my God, Brock Purdy throws the ball to Juwan Jennings and they lose eight yards on a throw. I mean, guys, they had the ball at at their own 36. I mean, you're damn near, near midfield again. Great field position. You back yourself up to the 28 on a throw. I mean, guys, if I'm a Niners fan today, there's no way. I was making it to work. No way I was getting out of bed. And it's not even just because of the things that, that stand out the most, right? The punt, the, the, the extra point, the inability to, to score on those third downs where the, the blitz was immense. It's this shit that no one else is going to look at because it's irre- irrelevant to the, to, the, uh, to the score sheet. The little things. The little things the Chiefs do and the Niners don't. 
even looking back at this, I still can't believe McCaffrey does not get a single rush. Not a single rush. That is incomprehensible. Like I said at the top of the show, I liked the majority of what they did to win this game. But I had mentioned the, 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 the lack of going to McCaffrey, and this is where you saw it the most. It stands out the most. And I didn't think it was an incredibly bad day by Kyle Shanahan by any means. But as we know, against the Chiefs or in the Super Bowl in big games, it's going to come down to a series or two. And I think, weirdly enough, it might be these two series you look back on the most if you're the Niners and say this is where the game really could have changed the most. Especially the one off of that pick. But when you have two drives and you run a collective total of just over two minutes off the clock and don't score a single point, obviously, you know the more you leave that. I kept saying it to my buddies last night when we were watching. I go, the, the, the crack of the door is open. The door crack is open. It's been open the whole time. They never continued to shut the door. They just left it open for the Chiefs to somehow wiggle their way in there. And you know if you leave a sliver of the door open for the Chiefs, they're going to find a way to get inside. And as I said to you, the game was never the same after this, and it, and it surely wasn't. Let's go over what happens afterwards. We're now down to five minutes, five minutes in the third quarter. The Chiefs still have three points. We're damn near at the end of the third quarter. The Chiefs have three points. But they finally get a drive together under their belt because they started all the way back at their own 14. Nice drive here to at least be able to try and score points. Once again, the little things. When we talk about the Bills, right? You can't make the kick Tyler Bass at the end to at least give us a chance. Harrison Bucker on this drive. Sets the Super Bowl record for the longest field goal ever made in the Super Bowl. 57 yards down the wickets, down the middle. Would have been good from 60. And I think this is right in the moment right here, I think, where you might be saying to yourself, all right, here we go. We're start this is where we're we're gonna start to see the uh the inevitable. Because if you're knocking off uh, Super Bowl record field goals here, you can start to feel the momentum change, right? So there's the field goal. The Chiefs would then force yet again another three and out for the, for the Niners. Three and out. So that is now three consecutive drives that have been three and outs for the Niners on all three possessions. One rush attempt for Christian McCaffrey. One. That's it. Once again, this drive, one minute off the clock. So we're now at three drives for these Niners in this third quarter, and they have run literally three minutes. Each drive has lasted one minute. I mean, it, it it is insane. And here is where the inevitable finally comes home. You knew the crack was left open and you just kept saying it's all but certain at this point that there's going to be a moment where they take advantage of the Niners inability to close the door on this one. And it happens in a way that's just got to make you forever sick to your stomach as a Niners fan. Cause I do genuinely think if this doesn't happen, I don't know if the momentum swings enough to win this game for the Chiefs. They had nothing. We are down to less than three minutes in the ball in, in the third quarter of the ball game here. And the game will never be the same since. Three and out for the Chiefs, or three and out for the Niners, immediately followed up by another three and out for the Chiefs. I mean, guys, they had nothing. They had six points at this at, the, at this current juncture. And the only reason they got to six was because Bucker just set the Super Bowl record for field goal uh, distance and, and was able to nail it. That's how they were scoring their points. 
They couldn't get down the field in scoring territory. The only time they did, they fumbled it away. Outside of that, they weren't close. So they go three and out again. They have nothing. And there it is. There it is. The muffed punt. The muffed punt in the biggest game of your life. The biggest game of the year. Biggest game in American sports. And somehow, you know, I think a lot of people initially thought that Ray Ray McLeod just tried to make a play and pick the ball up off the bounce and it didn't work. No, that's not why he did it. Some dude for the Niners, I don't know him. The last name's L- Lutter, is it? Lutter? I mean, it hits the guy right, right on the damn shin. What, what are you supposed to do? And this is when I say it's a combination of a lot of great talent, a lot of the little things done right, and a dash of luck. And there's your dash of luck. The punt nails him right on the calf. Bounces to McDuffie, who somehow, God bless him, he realizes this. He tries to pick it up, doesn't. And now the Chiefs, who haven't been able to get into scoring territory all game long, haven't been able to do a damn thing on offense, get the ball on the 16-yard line. And when we want to talk about the difference between one team doing these little things and the other team not, okay? This quarter was a microcosm. The Chiefs throw a pick to start off the half. The Niners get the ball at the 44. At the very least, you're thinking a field goal is inevitable here. They lose a yard to show for the entire drive and punt it. A Chiefs team who couldn't do anything offensively all game long gets a muffed punt. It takes one play. One snap of the ball, a lofty toss from Mahomes all the way up in the air to a wide open MVS touchdown. And just like that, a Chiefs team who looked like their offense was left back in Missouri has a 13 to 10 lead with the third quarter winding down. I mean, I. I know the way the game ended. You're just going to remember how great Mahomes and this offense executed and how great the defense was able to stifle the Niners late. You're not going to remember how bad the Chiefs were before that happened. They were awful offensively, abysmal. These teams were trading three and outs, trading punts. They, neither team could do anything. All you had to, to not do was what they did, the Niners. All you had to not do was give it to them on a silver platter. And, and not only did you give it to them on a silver platter, you poured them up a glass of wine and got them a nice, nicely uh, you know, a freshly fluffed pillow for their feet and you're feeding grapes in their mouth. That's what a muffed pun in that situation is. Now, to their credit, they go and answer with a touchdown. The Niners hadn't been doing anything on offense either. They hadn't had been they haven't done a damn thing. A damn thing. To their credit. And I'm shocked that they did this. I was I was legitimately stunned when, when they got the touchdown on on the um the muff punt. I'm thinking to myself, you might as well just write it off. I mean, we were talking amongst our our buddies there, and we had felt like this one had the the, the makings now of a game that was going to finish like 21 to 10 Chiefs, and people were going to look back at this game and be like, oh, the Chiefs destroyed the Niners. When in reality, it was the opposite. And the scoreboard just happens to reflect the game that was terrible, and uh, and the Chiefs got the better side of of a, of a couple bounces in this game and took advantage of it when the Niners didn't. But to their credit, they went and answered. I was shocked that they did this. I didn't think they had it in them. I really didn't. But they would go on a nice sustained drive, twelve plays, a full seventy-five yards, six minutes. This was 
capped off by Juwan Jennings, who, my God, God bless him, that was your MVP if the Niners hang on. Do you know that Juwan Jennings to win MVP last night was plus 37,000? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me break down to you what that means, okay? If you were to have bet $100 on Jawan Jennings to win MVP last night, you would have won thirty seven grand, And he was going to win it. And you know there's some degen out there who had that ticket. Pacing like you wouldn't have believed. Because he was winning the MVP, Jawan Jennings. He was. He was the second player ever to have a throwing touchdown and a, and a catching touchdown to Nick Foles in the Super Bowl. So they answer. But the momentum had shifted already. The palpability of the Chiefs winning this game was already in the air. And once you allow that to get, once you allow the genie out of the bottle, good luck getting them back in there. And I think that the muffed punt that let the genie out of the bottle. And even though you had a hell of an effort trying to get them back in there with this touchdown drive, not so fast. He ain't going back in the, the jar that easily. This is the moment. Because I, th- I think even before this, you thought the Chiefs were winning. But if you're like me, you're stunned they go down on this touchdown drive. And maybe you're thinking, oh, maybe things are different. Maybe the Niners really do have the ability to pull this off. As soon as you see that extra point go off the back of somebody's helmet, you lose that you lose that mindset completely. You immediately go to, yep, that's your ball game. You immediately go to, there's not a prayer in hell that that doesn't matter in this game. There's not a shot in hell the Chiefs don't somehow exploit that missed extra point. Because it was massive. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like it put the Chiefs up or the Niners up uh twenty to, to sixteen if they make the extra point, or twenty one to sixteen if they make the extra point, right? It w- it wasn't like it was this huge difference. It was this huge difference. It's sixteen all, the most random score ever. It's sixteen all. Uh, an extra point here, you take the lead, and I think it changes the dichotomy of how you approach the rest of the game because you can't trade field goals like they ended up doing. This is why it impacted the game so much. If you continue to trade field goals, well, then the Niners would have won the ball game. Because what would happen after that is a field goal by the Chiefs, a field goal by the Niners, right? And a field goal by the Chiefs. But that field goal by the Chiefs at the end wouldn't have been allowed to have been taken because the Niners would have had 20 instead of 19. So a field goal there for the Chiefs does you nothing. Instead, the Chiefs are able to kick that field goal, take it to overtime, and we all knew the second Jim Nance starts reading you the new overtime rules, which, by the way, the irony the irony. Oh, 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 it's so poetic. Who gets their first crack at the new OT rules that were developed because of the Bills loss to the Chiefs? Oh, well, none other than the Kansas City Chiefs, of course. Sure. We haven't seen an overtime playoff game since the 13 second game. And sure as shit, the Chiefs are the ones to get that game. That has the new rules. Now, a lot of people don't care about this because it didn't end up mattering because the normal regular season rules were still essentially applicable the way that this game ended. But isn't it still a little ironic? Because even if the Niners went down and scored a touchdown there, the Chiefs went down and answered. I just thought it was incredibly hilarious that of all the teams to have the first opportunity to be the beneficiaries of the new overtime rule. It's the mother effing chiefs in the damn bowl. You know, (laughs) 
like I said, it didn't end up mattering, but just the thought of that, you know, just the thought of that, it, it adds a little more hilarity to the whole thing, doesn't it? But that's what that mix, missed extra point resulted in. You would not have been able to trade field goals if you're the Chiefs because the field goal wouldn't have done you any good at the end. You wouldn't have been able to tie it. You would have lost. You would have had to have gone for the touchdown, and maybe you lose in regulation. That mixed extra, extra point was everything. So what did this game come down to? And this is why earlier I said, you know, Shanahan, a couple of real bad blunders, in my opinion, not getting McCaffrey involved early in that third quarter. But by and large, you're a missed extra point and a muff punt away from winning the Super Bowl. And that's got nothing to do with, with Kyle Shanahan's play calling ability. And there's your recap, essentially, of these little things. And one more little thing. And, um, and this is what separates the Chiefs once again. It's an even playing field in overtime, right? It's an even playing field. New game. And never more so than now with these new rules. It's a whole new game. Every team's going to be able to, to possess it, even touchdown or not, right? Niners put together a well of a drive in this overtime. I was thoroughly impressed. And they were even the beneficiaries of a holding call. Folks, stop the presses. A holding call against the Chiefs in the Super Bowl in overtime? Pause, folks. Pigs are flying. Hell just froze over. We're witnessing history here. Because the defense of the Chiefs came out with vengeance. They had the Niners on the ropes. Guys, it's third and 13. Good luck. The only way you're getting a, a first down here is if exactly what happens, happens. McDuffie, first team all pro, defensive holding, hadn't made a mistake all year. Moved the sticks. Now, as a Chiefs better, I'm standing here. I'm like, oh, you know what? You got to be shitting me. Then you get this thought once again creeping in your head. Maybe it's not destiny for the Chiefs. This never happens to the Chiefs. This doesn't seem like Chiefs. Maybe it's the Niners night. And they put together a damn good drive. 13 plays, nearly eight minutes. This was their best drive of the night. But it's all about bending and not breaking. And they never broke. These Chiefs on defense rarely broke the whole night long. The Niners have it. They're Inside the 10, they're at the 9. And Chris Jones, once again, saves the game for the Kansas City Chiefs. He comes in on this third and four, untouched. Untouched. I, I, I don't know who's, whoever w had the blocking assignment on that for the Niners. I mean, he, he, he should have been cut last night. Inexcusable. It's the play of the century for you. I mean, the play, the, the play of the franchise, maybe, at, up until the, at, at this point, right? You haven't won a Super Bowl in, in, a, in a quarter century. I mean, we're talking about having it right here for us. And Chris Jones, I mean, I could have I made that play if, they, if, if, if the offensive line was going to treat me the way they treated Chris Jones. The only difference between me and Chris Jones is that, you know, he's only one of the greatest defensive rushers on the planet. Let him walk in. Walk. Walked in, and oh my God, oh boy, Brock Purdy, he, he, he had his man wide open. If they would have just given him another full second, maybe we're talking about a different outcome today. But Chris Jones com comes in untouched all over Brock Purdy's shit, and, and that ball goes two miles over the head of the intended target. You got to settle for the field goal. And we all know what happens after that. A masterful drive and a drive that we all knew was going to happen. And once again, it comes down to these little things that they do that the Niners don't, that no one else does. I mean, think about it. The Niners were three, third and four away. Third and four away from really putting the, 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 the pressure on the Chiefs, because even if they score a touchdown, the Niners just need a field goal, right? But they couldn't do it, and they couldn't do it in regulation. 
to ice the game. Two third and, and mediums, and they could not get either one. Either one of them probably would have won them the game or gave them their best chance to do it. But here come the Chiefs. You give them the chance. Everyone knew they were going to win it. Just a matter of how they're going to do it. And they did it in a way that I thought was even more impressive than I would have imagined because they get, they immediately start the series and go three plays without getting a first down. They got to go for it. And they get it. The little things. Mahomes, beautifully executed run. That gorgeous run I was talking about earlier. Gets it. First and 10. Right? They lose three yards. That terrible decision by MVS to catch it and run backwards. And you're thinking, oh, my God. Oh, maybe it's not in the cards. Third and six. Similar to the same opportunities the Niners had, right? Third and six. 13 yards. It's what they do that they don't, right? Third and four and a third and five for the Niners would have been the difference in this game. Couldn't get either one. Third and six for the Chiefs. 13 yards like it's nothing. Like it's nothing. Send the house at Mahomes, genius, genius. That's only going to result in Rasheed Rice being wide the hell open on a dump route, runs it up the field, right? Then third and one, again, you allow Mahomes to run it up the middle for 20 yards. And that was the moment right there. When Mahomes ran the ball up the middle for 20 yards, game over. You knew it was over. I mean, you really probably already knew it was over before that, but you knew you were about to watch these guys win the Super Bowl. And sure as hell, two plays later, perfectly executed route by McCole Hardman. Get some wide open dump route or dump throw by Mahomes. Put it in the history books. Three of the last five, three championships for Mahomes, three MVPs for Mahomes in the championship, and the dynasty is born. Just like that. But we just thoroughly, we probably just spent about 45 minutes thoroughly going over each really impactful drive of that game. And as we're going through it, don't you, don't you really relive the amount of opportunities the Niners have or had? And don't you really relive really the, uh, the lack of any tangible thing to hold on to? when it came to the Chiefs' ability to win this game up until that muff punt. I mean, you go, we go through this whole, this whole list. It, it really brings you back to what you forget, even though it was just last night. Like, you forget. These guys couldn't do a damn thing, and the Niners had them. And, like, you just go back and you look at it step by step, and you just watch the degradation of a franchise, right? You just watch the slow kill of the San Francisco 49ers the death by a thousand cuts as you scroll down that gameplay list and even though you can't watch the highlights when you're just looking at the list you just visibly see these momentum changes you visibly see the changing of the guard within the game the Niners were the better team for like three quarters of this game and it didn't matter. And it's just back to the overarching point. The Ravens were the better team all year. Didn't matter. The Bills were the better team for about a full half, I would say, against the Chiefs in the divisional. Didn't matter. The Niners, they were easily the, going away the best team in the NFC this year. At times, for the majority of the year, really, they might have been the best team until the Ravens took over. One seed, better team on paper, no question. Better team last night for 70% of the game. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. Because it's all about these little intricacies within the game that the Chiefs are just masterful at. And when you add on top of that the ability to take advantage of those opportunities, then that's all the difference. And that's where Mahomes comes in and Andy Reid comes in. You get the muff punt. You immediately score. You get the opportunity in overtime to win it. You immediately score. You get the opportunity to tie it, to send it to overtime. You immediately take advantage, right? Maybe they couldn't do a damn thing all the way up until about the two-minute mark of the third quarter. I mean, that's a fact. They couldn't. But nobody cares because it doesn't matter. They did it when it mattered the most. Go back to the Bills game, right? 
that unbelievable deep pass Mahomes had to start the third quarter off to the MVS there. And then you look at what the Bills situation was. Same exact type of situation that deep ball to digs couldn't have been thrown better. Drop. This is just what it is with this team and with everybody else. And it's not just the Bills. Everybody likes to make it seem like it's just the Bills. It's because the Bills have had the most cracks at the Chiefs. I mean, I'll say it again. Since 2020, nobody's beaten the Chiefs more than the Bills and the Bengals. They're both tied, I believe, for three wins each. I've said it a thousand times. The talent gap is very marginal between these two. And there's been several times where the Bills have been the superior team. But they're not superior at the intricacies within the ball game that ultimately end up resulting in wins and losses. It's not necessarily all about being the better team. It's not necessarily all about having the better quarterback that day, the better performance that day. That sure helps, but it's not everything. And we have three Super Bowl, or we have two at least, I would say two playoff losses to prove that. The first one, not so much. But we have two playoff losses to prove that <laughs> it's, not, it's not all about how great you played that game. Don't think Josh Allen played great in that 13-second game, you know? Don't think they did enough in that divisional game. Scored more points than anybody scored on in the entire playoffs. And really, they scored just about as many points as the Chiefs have allowed all year long. They didn't allow anybody to score more than 27 points all year long. Not what it's all about. Now, it's just, it's insane. It's insane. Let's go to your comments. Brought to you by... BetUS, make sure to check out the link in the description below from BetUS. They'll give you a 125% sign-up bonus, not only on your first deposit, but on your first three deposits with the promo coin uh, code, rather, JOIN125. Click that link in the bio to take advantage of that. Plus, they'll give you a 10% gambler's insurance for your net losses if you're active for six months. Once again, link in the bio below. Take advantage of that awesome offer from my friends over at BetUS. Let's take a look at the comments section. We'll start with the Super Chats, and we'll kick it off with Rich, who came in earlier saying, let's be real. After watching that, it infuriates me more that the Bills could have won it all if not for decimated injuries. Next season, we come in for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's what we, we went over that a lot here. There's a lot of fan bases feeling that way. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, that's the that's really the, 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 theme, of the, the theme of the dynasty here. It's, it's not that the Chiefs were just this juggernaut where they're just steamrolling you. It's been a lot of years of, wow, everyone's felt like they've had their cracks, but they just don't take advantage. They can't break through. While the Chiefs always do. Yeah, it infuriates me twice as much. Do I think the Bills could have beat that Niners team last night? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yes. Hell yes. And I think they could have beaten the Niners or the, the Ravens to get there. But it doesn't matter. All I get to do is sit back and, and, and think about coulda, shoulda, wouldas. That's all I get to think about. That's all Ravens fans get to think about. That's all the Niners fans get to think about. That's all anybody gets to think about that's not a fan of these guys. And it's something else. And it must be nice. It must be nice. I mean, it must be getting old at this point. Imagine, imagine winning Super Bowl is getting old for you. Richie, once again, saying, I don't care if it's a conspiracy. Did anyone else see anyone else, anyone see Chiefs loss? I mean, there's no conspiracy involved. I mean, unless the conspiracy theorists are able to dictate a, a muffed punt and a missed extra point, then, hey, bravo to them. An incredible job. Niners were the better team. Should have won the game. It, it, it's just this innate ability for the Chiefs to, like, force you into making mistakes and then their ability to capitalize on them. And even when they make their own mistakes, it doesn't ever really seem to burn them. Like they fumbled the ball. They fumbled the ball yesterday five times and it just doesn't burn them. Like what team goes into a Super Bowl or a playoff game and fumbles the ball five damn times and it doesn't cost them. They only lost one of them. Niners lost two of them. That's the difference. Fumbled the ball five times. Lost one of them. Niners lost two of them. Throw a pick, right? They can't score on it. They can't do anything with it. 
That's the difference. By the way, I also want to say, I thought last night this game was very well officiated. Shout out Bill Vinovich. He's one of my favorites, actually. He has been. I just think he's even tempered. Seems like he just kind of lets it go. I thought, look, there's probably a lot of plays last night you could look at and say, oh, they could have called this or they should have called that. I thought it was well officiated. It never felt really at any point other than maybe that hold in overtime, but you went back and saw the replay and you're like, oh, yeah, that's a hold. Um, It never really felt like the officiating got in the way of the game, and that's all you can really ask for in a game like that. So I thought that that was um, a, a nice element of the game. Uh, Signify no saying, to be fair, the Ravens never had a chance. Lamar is a, a notorious playoff choker. I mean, I, I don't think that's true. The, the Chiefs did not play well enough. I mean, they, they didn't do anything at all in the second half. They didn't score at all. And, like, the Ravens were in that game the whole game despite not being able to do anything. And if Zay Flowers get, gets into the end zone without fumbling the football, you can't tell me that they don't have a chance to win that football game. They just did everything in their power to lose it. They certainly had their chances. Just weren't good enough. And I, I agree. Lamar, I agree in a sense that Lamar did not play well at all. I mean, it was a bad, bad game. That was a bad game from Lamar, but he was not benefited by his coaching staff or his players surrounding him either. And, um, and once again, chiefs benefactors of, of, of terrible performance by one team and their ability to squeeze it out on their side, despite not playing their best football either. And, and, and it's a, it's a credit ultimately to their defense. Their defense was the star of the show. If you could give an MVP to anybody the MVP should have been given to, to, to Steve Spagnuolo last night and, and the 11 starting football players on their defensive side of things. If you could cut a little piece of that MVP up and give it to all those guys, that's who it should have been given to. That's who it probably should have been given to for the year-long MVP too, this Chiefs defense. It's the reason they got to where they were last night, and it's really the reason they probably end up, ended up winning the game as well. Rich saying, Chiefs will regress soon when Kelsey Reed out to BH. I mean, maybe. Said the same thing about Tyreek Hill, two consecutive Super Bowl championships. Everybody said Tyreek Hill's gone. This team's not going to be the same. They just went on to win a Super Bowl with their leading receiver being who? Um, uh, at the time, who was it? Um, what's his face from, from the Steelers? Um, well, this year it was a rookie, Rasheed Rice. Who am I thinking of? Someone, someone tell me. Who the hell am I thinking of? Um, oh, Juju Smith-Schuster, Juju Smith-Schuster, right? So like you lose Tyreek Hill and everybody's like, oh, who, who do they have now? But Kelsey and your best receiver in one year is Juju Smith-Schuster, who you don't even keep for the team the next year. And after that, <laughs> it's a rookie Rasheed Rice. So I don't know if it's going to matter. Because uh, Tyreek Hill is, uh, in my opinion, a more impactful player than Kelsey. And that's not a knock at Kelsey because he's one of the greatest players I've ever seen in my life. But Tyreek Hill is one of the most off-the-charts players I've ever seen in my life. Like, like we've seen great tight ends. It just so happens Kelsey's one of the greatest. We haven't seen a whole lot of Tyreek Hills. Like that's a whole different. I don't even know what that is. It's some sort of sorcery. So when you lose that, it's easy to say, man, that really could have been a major difference, a major factor for these guys during this run here. <laughs> and they went back to back without him. With really, I mean, let's be honest. Maybe one of the worst wide receiver cores in the league. Maybe. So. I'm at the point now where I'm I'm done. Like I I I just I'm done trying to be like, oh, there'll be this when this happens, or there'll be this when that happens. There'll be this when I see it. Cause hell, I saw it this year and they still weren't <laughs> that. So let me know when they get bounced from the playoffs, and hopefully it's the Bills doing the bouncing. GP saying, in other news, McDaniels lost his uh, his Dungeons and Dragons tournament last night. That's good to hear. GP always coming in with a nice D and D comment. It always brings a smile to my face. I could. I wonder if he was playing during the game. I wonder if he couldn't stomach watching the game. You know, a lot of people on Twitter love to tell you that they don't watch the game. A lot of these random people. 
I don't spend my time watching sports. That's for the, you know, that's for the non-intellectuals watching the ball go back and forth, those losers. I'll spend the night posting on Facebook. I always loved that. Like, you're above watching sports, which apparently is, like, something to be above of. I, I don't quite get it. But in turn, you spend your time just in the Twitter comments letting everybody know you don't watch sports. Like, oof. It's something about the Super Bowl, every time, it's not like it's during the regular season or whatever, but during the Super Bowl, everybody loves to come online and tell you they're not watching it. So you're just admitting that you're kind of like, like nobody would, nobody would want to be around you type person. Like think about it. If you're hanging or if you're hanging out and the guy next to you is like, if you're like, oh, yo, so what are you doing the Super for the Super Bowl? And the guy's like, I'm not watching the Super Bowl. Wouldn't you be like, ooh, like, get me away from this guy. I think I might be in danger. Because I, I never heard that before in my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little flight or fight mode here. Because I don't know how to deal with this. It's so weird. Like I went online yesterday and there's like all these polls. Like, you watching the game today? No. 75% are like, no. It's like, what? Okay. People are still like, oh, like, you know. Ever since ever since Colin Kaepernick took that knee that knee eight years ago, I, I still have to go online and tell you I'm not watching. Well, the uh, newsflash, uh, the, the Super Bowl set a record rating yesterday for the most watched one in history. So to all these people who are online saying they're not watching it, well, somebody's watching it, and there's more and more people watching it every year. So I always find that to be pretty funny. But Rich is saying, I, I thought you were going to have a coronary with Rico. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too, brother. I'm shocked I survived that stream. When because I hadn't seen the Stephen A clip yet. You know, I, I hadn't seen the Stephen A clip yet. That that drove a fire into me I haven't felt in a while. That that was that was something. I haven't felt that in a minute. The, the, I, that was one of the worst 30 second segments of television I have ever seen in my life. The ability to just make millions of dollars and go online and just, or on TV rather, and just say that with no repercussions is incredible to me. Like you can just go on TV and just rip someone to shreds who you have no idea who they are. I mean, and that was the other thing. He was so wrong. His claims were so baseless. He was calling Aaron Schatz a, a homer who was scared to go back in the Bills locker room if he didn't vote for Josh Allen, and he's a coward. And you're sitting here, and you're like, man, this couldn't be more wrong if he tried. And and and, and you got, like, the host there, Molly, she's like, 100%, 100%, yep. And and, and Skip's like, or um, uh, Ch Shannon Char or whoever the hell was on there, like, oh, yep, yep, yep. And you're just like, this is, this is the pioneers of the media these days. Like this is the, this is who's leading the charge of our, of our, um, illustrious sports media industry. Wow. Like I understand having a stern, hard take. Don't get me wrong. And I don't really have a problem with Stephen A. I, I admire the guy's ability to have built what he's built. That is not easy to do. I mean, the guy is synonymous with sports broadcasting. You know how hard that is to do, especially if you're somebody like me who just appreciates the field so much and has admired it ever since I was a kid. You can't not have your respect for Stephen A. That's why I hate seeing stuff like that. It's because it's such a low, it's such a low take. It's such a low barometer being set by a guy who should have a way higher standard when it comes to saying stuff like that. That's how I see it. It's not because I dislike the guy, it's because I expect more. And, I, and again, it's getting to the point now, though, where it's not just him. It's all this. It's all of these entities where, like, you, I guess you really can't expect more anymore. It's not what it is. It's just not what it's become. And luckily for us, though, we now have stuff like this, like we do here and in, in, in all these great channels that Bill's Mafia has at their disposal and all these other channels that cover the NFL and stuff like that. There's nice to have options now because there's never been a time where you need more options. Because back in the day, I mean, that's the only take you're going to get. You know, even even back when I was growing up, the only take I'm going to get is what the one I'm getting from ESPN or the radio. You know, I'm not getting anything online. Twitter wasn't there yet. 
I'm not getting anything on, on, on podcasts or YouTube. That, that, that wasn't there yet either. So that's the, the struggle I have with it is like the guy has built a media empire and has worked uh, his ass off all year to literally become one of the biggest icons ever when it comes to um, sports television. And it's just a shame to see a topic that really doesn't, it doesn't, that, that situation, the MVP situation, it didn't call for such a, a staunch, stern, and wrong statement. It really didn't. It couldn't have been like the further. It was a topic that was furthest from something that that deserved that type of of saying, or that type of of, of um, notion being spewed out. And then for everybody to sit around and argue or to, to, to nod in agreement, I don't know. Just had a really big problem with it. But whatever, you know. Like I said at the time, doesn't matter. Unfortunately, and I'm starting to wonder if it's ever going to. Uh, th th this MVP anymore. I don't know what it is. I don't know what these awards are anymore. The Pro Bowl is non-existent now, and it's starting to really feel like there's there's the novelty of these MVP and these awards in general are starting to wear off a bit. Hopefully, it gets corrected. You know, we'll see. But um, let's talk about the halftime show. My favorite social experiment every year. And I'm going to give you guys a heads up. I'm going to do it next year so you can be on the lookout for it. But my favorite social experiment. I think I've done this the last three years now. I will just immediately when the halftime show starts, I will tweet, is this the worst halftime show we've ever seen? And it just, it's, it's like, it's like light. It's like pouring kerosene down two streams. Like you pour a little puddle of kerosene, and then you you pour it down one stream to the left and one to the right, and you light it, and it goes two ways, split right down the middle. I'll have people on the left ripping me apart. What the hell are you watching? Are you stupid? There really are two Americas or two different sides of Twitter. I kept hearing that. Like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. This and that. And then people down the right that are like, yep, this is awful. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. This is trash. You know, bring me back to the days of Prince. Where's Pr Can we resurrect Prince? Can we get the ghost of Prince out here, please, to play a little purple rain for us? Because this is god awful. Right. Here's what it was. Okay. Here's what the halftime show was. It was okay. It's okay. It was a f five out of 10, maybe. I think it was a little bit better than last year because <laughs> last year with Rihanna and I, and this is the problem I have. I love Rihanna. Who doesn't love Rihanna? Come on. It was just a little too meh for me. It was a little too slow for me. Wasn't a whole lot of theatrics. Wasn't a whole lot of like up and down. Like you can say what you want about all the guests that they had at, uh, at the Super Bowl at SoFi. But I mean, was it not a marvel to sit back and watch Dr. Dre with Eminem and, and Snoop Dogg and all these icons from LA? Like whether you liked it or not, like at least it was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Getting all these OGs from the, from the Cali days, from the area together in one performance, right? Especially because Dr. Dre had influenced all of their careers, right? Was the producer behind a lot of their success. Last night, it starts off. Can I just put it bluntly? It, terrible. There was no cool entrance there was no stage th th this is what it was it was it felt like a guy with a steady cam and i'm not talking like a tv camera i'm talking like it felt like a guy remember back in the day when your parents would get the little handy cam out during christmas remember what'd you get there zach oh look at that another pair of socks oh we love those don't we Look at that. Say say thank you to grandma, remember? Right? With a little handy cam. 
that's what it felt like the thing was being filmed on. And it also felt like the guy behind it was halfway cocked. It was shaking all over the place. I mean, it was like this. It was like, what the, What are we doing? And and it's just Usher on the field. It's almost like, like if you didn't know who Usher was, it was almost like they found this guy in the stands and just said, hey, go out on the field and, and start doing a little dance. <laughs> there was nothing to it. And behind him were like a thousand people in different costumes. There was no cohesiveness to it. Everyone was wearing something different. It felt like a mess. It felt like they just put the whole thing together during the third quarter where they're like, we're going to scrap the whole plan. Usher, you're just going to go out there. We're going to throw this guy out here with a, with a handy cam. And we're just going to get a bunch of people from the crowd behind you. And we're just going to, we're just going to start grooving. So that's what it was in the beginning. And I'm like, man, this is uh, this is bad. This is bad. And then Alicia Keys comes out. Love Alicia Keys. I mean, once again, if you, if you appreciate a, a good singing voice, you got to like Alicia Keys. And she comes out and hits that first note. And it's like, it's like, oh, oh, but hey, even legends have a couple cracks every now and then she recovered. It was great. But everybody online now is all over the fact that Usher is like, they're like loving up on each other. And apparently like she's married and everybody's, I don't know any of this stuff. I'm not deep into the, into the pop music scene like that, but apparently she's married and everybody's like, Oh my God. And he's hugging her and she's she's smiling and he, he she, the, the husband's gotta be enough. So we're getting like a million memes out of that. The memes have been off. I mean, that's all you can really ask for, but it, it, I, I compare, I compare the halftime to the game. The first half of that game was utter, utter dog piss. It was terrible. It was trash. I, I spent more time g going up to the wing bar at the, at the party I was at than I was watching the game. That's how bad it was, right? That's kind of what the, the first half of this Super Bowl uh, or, or the halftime show was where I'm like, dude, this is just brutal. But then, you know, you bring out Lou to Chris, you bring out Lil John. You get that stage. They got the stage going right with the dudes on the the dudes and the ladies on the rollerblades, right? You got some ambiance. You got the lights and the and then I'm like, now they got me a little bit. Now they got me. So really weak in the first half. Really okay to enjoyable in the second half, and that's why I give it about a five. Cut it right down the middle. Not good in the first half. Enjoyable in the second half. We'll cut it down the middle. Um, I never quite understood the choice for Usher in the first place. I feel like the last time he released a single, I was in eighth grade. So I don't really know. Um, but next year it's in New Orleans. It better be Lil Wayne. It better be Lil Wayne in New Orleans with the whole Young Money crew. You can get me down on that. You can get me down on that. Now, they're not very good live. Like most rap shows aren't very good live, but they don't. It's not like they're really doing the whole thing. Like they're doing it without the background. It would be killer. Lil Wayne's from New Orleans, so you get that whole crew out there. You probably throw Drake out there, and then they got you got Nicki Minaj out there. Everybody loves and whatever. They could really do that well. We'll see what they do. But I never really, uh, I never really understood the choice for Usher. It just kind of felt like it was a little, uh. 2010 ish to me uh give him credit the guy looks the same today as he did when i was in eighth grade um holy hell the dudes the dudes in shape guy does not age and he does have some bangers but you know what a lot of his big songs are like slower songs too that was another thing i, I, I think like it wasn't really hitting home for me a couple of these slower ballads but that's when you bring out little John and Ludacris and you just start getting the place going. Then you can get and you got me into it a little bit, you know. But it is the most divisive thing on the planet. The Super Bowl halftime show. I just saw something on here that I, that I liked that I resonated with. Sal said the word great is way overused. That is so true. That is so, so true. You really shouldn't say great as often as we do. Like if you 
Like, how's your day going? Great. Is it really a great day? Like, you can remember great days. Is every day really a great day? Right? You know, oh, we went out to dinner last night. How, how was the food? Great. Is it the best meal you ever had? Is it like top 10? Answer is probably not. It was, it was good. But the problem is when you say good, good isn't really great. You see what I'm saying? Great has become the new good. And good has become the new meh. Right? You say something's good. It's kind of like, oh, it's just. I feel like people take that as, oh, it's just okay. Right? It's just, eh, it's whatever. It's good. Oh, it's good. People are like, oh, well, that's. It's whatever. When you say great, you say it so much. I feel like that now means, oh, it was good. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Oh, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Right? And I think that that's kind of skewed up a lot of the way we think about things now. Because can we be honest? That halftime show, I don't care who you are. It wasn't great. There was nothing great about it. Like great should be different. It should be like, are we talking about this forever? Right? Like, you still talk about Whitney Houston singing at the Bills Super Bowl back in the 90s. People still talk about that. People still talk about Michael Jackson. I, and this is all, and now once again, it's all, it's all opinion based. I am a huge Katy Perry fan. I, I love her. I love her. And I forget the year. It was within the last decade here. But Katy Perry did the halftime show. I thought that was great. The stage was incredible. The crew she had working with her was unreal. They were dressed in all these outfits that all match. Like some were sharks and some were that. She did like four outfit changes. She's coming down from the ceiling. And I love all of her music too. So that was great to me. So I understand if last night you're a huge Usher fan. You love Usher. And this, and you love Luda Chris and whatever, and you thought it was great. Okay, fine. But there was like so many people online, like, that was great. That was great. And are all of them massive Usher fans? I highly doubt it. So I think we definitely confuse great and good a lot of the time. And it's like last night, and, and we and it, a lot of it is 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 how we perceive the most recent thing we've seen. So, like last night's Super Bowl, it will be remembered as great. And I have a tough time saying it wasn't great. But the crazy thing is, is that game lasted roughly 75 minutes. And for about 45 of those 75 minutes, it sucked, right? So, more than half the game legitimately kind of sucked but the ending was so great and it was a great ending that it, the whole game then just becomes great right and I even have a tough time saying that game wasn't great but in reality it was probably good the entirety of the game was probably good it was a good game but the ending was so great then the whole game just becomes great so it's certainly left up for interpretation, but I've never seen something split America. I mean, there's a lot, I guess, that does this, but but nothing more so on an on an annual routine basis than the than the Nash or the um not, not the national anthem, the uh um the Super Bowl halftime show. It splits the nation down the middle. Love it. Hate it. I thought it was just okay. But really, I don't know. I don't know if the halftime show is even for me, anyways. Like, I'm not watching it for the halftime show. I'm guessing most of you aren't either, but some people are. So maybe it's more for those people. Like, some people are watching the Super Bowl. There's a reason why the Super Bowl gets 110 million viewers and, um, you know, a playoff game gets 40. People watch the Super Bowl for different things: the commercials. The um, the halftime show. So at the end of the day, I really just don't really care. And if it's cool, great. If it's not that great, whatever. 
Commercials um, didn't really pay a whole hell of a lot of attention. I never really do. Those don't really matter to me all that much. Um, I'm noticing that there's just a sea of money that 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 these companies have now that I can't even like wrap my head around. Like, and I don't know where the money. I don't even know where the money comes from. Like that Timu company that sell it's like an Amazon that's in um I believe it's it's out of China is it Timu uh, it's somewhere on the it's somewhere over in Asia I believe Timu is out of Asia China somewhere I let me look it up where where is Timu out of it, 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 they had a bunch of like these animated commercials last night and if I don't know if you've heard about Timu but it's it's like Amazon, but everything costs like 75 cents. Yeah, so Timu ships everything from China. It's a, it's a Chinese e-commerce com, e company um, which offers heavily discounted goods which are mostly shipped to consumers directly from China. I've been on this app, and it's like one of those apps where you open it up and you have to, like, you have to play like a gambling game in order to um get into the into the thing. You ever use Timu? Oh, I love it. But it's like So it's people like her as to why they have four they have the budget for four Super Bowl commercials. You know they had four Super Bowl no, commercials? Never good and it's a party's apps. Yeah, the app's impossible to use. You have to play like a slot machine game in order to even use the app. So multiple times. Yeah, everything costs like 9 cents. And everything on there has got to be like a safety hazard. Yeah, and I think it's mainly made by, yeah, like, yeah, it's got to be some real scary shit, right? Anyway, they had what three or four Super Bowl commercials last night. Everything costs like 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 less than a buck on there, and you mean to tell me they got a hundred mil to shill out on Super Bowl ads? The other one too. Up oh, Tony or Tofu. How are you, sweetheart? I think Caroline's gotten Tofu a couple of things off of Timu, maybe. The other thing too is um also a lot of advertisements for like these agencies and stuff that are like or, or like entities, I guess you could say, that I don't really know. It, it, it always confuses me. Like, where's the money coming from? And and where's like what's the, what's the goal? There were multiple commercials about like bullying and multiple religion commercials. And what interests me about that is that these commercials cost like $20 million to make. And I always wonder like, where's the money coming from? What's the intended purpose? Because at the end of the day, all of these things are about making a profit. You're not spending $20 million on an advertisement for the hell of it. Right. So like, where is, I, I don't know. There's a lot of these, like, there, there was like multiple bullying commercials where like Saquon Barkley and Cameron Hayward were like pretend, like reading a manuscript from someone who had been bullied, which like, don't get me wrong. I get all of it. Obviously it's a good message. Certainly. Like, I'm, I'm not denying any of that, obviously. I'm not saying, like, oh, what are you doing spreading that message around? Not the bully kids. How dare you? No, it's not that. It's, it's like, $20 million for it, and you got to wonder, like, how it's happening. It always, it always interests me, you know? Because somebody's got to be paying for it, and somebody's got to be expecting a return on that payment, and for what? I don't know. It's interesting. And then the other commercials, like, oh, my God, the, the Ben Affleck one with, with, with the Dunkin' Donuts and Tom Brady. I don't know what I watched. I don't know what that was. Man, oh, man. Um, what else was there? What else do I even remember? I don't know. Do you guys have a favorite one? Was there anything particularly great that I got to go back and watch? I do love the one I think I love the most. It's mainly just because I love Aubrey Plaza. I love Aubrey Plaza. Love her. And she had the uh, the Mountain Dew Baja Blast commercial. 
where she was just talking about how everything was a blast, but she's a very monotone, like unexcited person. So that was like the joke of it. But I just love Aubrey Plaza. So maybe that's why I like the commercial. That was probably my favorite. I would say the rest. I don't really remember. I've just seen so many people today, like up in arms about the religion commercials. And I guess it kind of, it kind of makes sense. Everybody's mad. They're like, well, if you have the money to pay for all these commercials, like why are we not giving it to the people who need it the most? And I, I didn't really think about it like that. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, maybe that, that kind of actually makes a little bit of sense <laughs> because I remember seeing them and I'm, every time I see him, I'm always just like, what, like who's paying for this? Am I paying for this? <laughs> you know, are we paying for this? And what are we trying to get back uh, on the other end of it? Um, then I went on Twitter today and everybody's like up in arms about it, which I guess is, I guess is fair, but I, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not an advertising mogul. Maybe there's something to it that I'm missing here. I have no idea. Um, are we having the goat debate in the, in the, in the chat? I think I'm seeing that right now. Look, if we're not, I think we are. I think we're talking about GOAT. We're talking about Tom Brady and, 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 and Patrick Mahomes comparison. Okay, I got a couple things to say about that. One, whether you agree with it or not, I mean, strap in. It's all you're going to be hearing till the end of time. So either get used to it or stop watching the sport because it's all you're going to see. You're never going to turn a TV channel on that has sports on it or a radio on or, or a game on or whatever. You're never going to turn anything on again without this being part of the discourse. This is going to be the new golden goose for all of these debate shows. I mean, think about it. We still have the LeBron Jordan debate. At this point, nothing's changed. You either like Jordan more or you like LeBron more? I mean, we've been having the debate for, for going on a decade here. So you're either on one side of it or not. But yet we still, you still see it all the time on the internet, all the time on TV, right? Get ready. This is the new Jordan LeBron. They've been waiting for it. They've been waiting. It's the golden goose. You can extract every ounce of airtime that you possibly could want from this topic because it's divisive. There's somewhat credible arguments on both sides, although I think that the, the, the you're nuts to say that there is a surpassing that's happened. If you want to sit and argue he's well on his way, I'm I'm on your side. I'm in your camp for sure. If you want to say it's done and over with, I, I can't be that guy, man. The guy retired last year. The guy retired last year. Do I think he's on his way? It has the best crack out of anybody ever maybe to do it. I certainly do. Do I sit here today and say it's done and over with when, when, when it's not, I mean, come on, but that's, what's going to happen. That's what's going to, that's, what's going to happen. So strap in and get ready for it, whether you like it or not. Now, with that said, is it credible? The argument, the debate, the comparisons. Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, 100% earned, deserved, incredible. Okay. We've never seen anything like it. This start is better than anything Tom Brady did in his start. And that's saying something. Now, the, the, the rise to what Brady did is more impressive to me because the guy is drafted in the sixth round and wouldn't have even started had Drew Bledsoe not got in his body rearranged on one of the hardest hits we've ever seen. The way Brady became what he became, that has to be one of the most triumphant stories and most improbable stories of all time, right? Because it really probably shouldn't have ever happened. Uh, 
I mean, here's Tom Brady drafted in the sixth round. Drew Bledsoe had just gotten a record contract from the Patriots. At the time, I think it was the, the most expensive contract in the history of the NFL. I think it was over $100 million. At the time, that was the biggest. So you're, you're, you're signing up for, for the, the Bledsoe experience here, but you draft Brady in the sixth round because, hey, why not? Bill, Bill Belichick saw something in him. He's there. We'll take him. Belichick or Bledsoe gets nailed on the sideline against the Jets. Brady's got to go in, and he goes on to win the Super Bowl in that same year. That is one of the most impressive things ever done in sports. You come off the bench as a sixth round pick, right? Behind a guy that had just gotten the biggest contract in the league. And you win the you win the whole thing. It's nuts. In fact, you look so good doing it that Bledsoe was healthy in the playoffs, and they still went with Brady. And then Brady got banged up in the playoffs. Bledsoe went in and won one of the games at the end, and both of them were healthy for the Super Bowl, and Brady went with, or Belichick went with Brady. And the rest is history. People forget, Belichick could have started Bledsoe in that first Super Bowl against Carolina. And that's how it all started. That's how Bledsoe became a bill. That's how Laura Malloy became a bill. Remember all this shit? Like, it's crazy that it, how it all happened. The craziness is not as nuts for the Mahomes. Everyone knew there was potential there. He was a top 10 pick, but he was a project, of course. No one ever knew he was going to be this. But it was impressive for the Chiefs to have drafted him when they did because Alex Smith was still a playoff quarterback. Alex Smith was still a very good quarterback in this lead, leading the Chiefs towards the top of the pack in the AFC. They weren't getting over the hump. They weren't the best team, like, of course, they are now, but they were still there, obviously. And for him to have done what he's done, it is the most impressive thing I've ever seen from the start of a career, and that's including, like, the beginning of Brady's career. Brady, What he did was the most improbable, most triumphant thing. But he didn't go to six consecutive AFC championships in six starting seasons. I mean, the guy's gone to an AFC championship, Mahomes, every single year he started. And four of the six years, he's gone to the Super Bowl. Three of those, he's won them. And the two years he didn't go to the Super Bowl, he lost in overtime. I mean, it's insane, insane, insane shit. Unprecedented shit. You add that with the fact that he's got three Super Bowl MVPs at this point, two regular MVPs. He is well on pace to not only surpass Tom Brady and the and the you know the Chiefs are not only well on pace to surpass the, the Patriots, but it, they're they're on they're on a pace now. Granted, how sustainable that is, we'll never know, but we can only base it on what we've seen thus far, and what we've seen thus far is a pace that will make that look like chump change if it continues, and that is absolutely absurd. The fact that that's even being said. And that it's facts is disgusting, especially because we just watched it end. It's not like it just not like it ended twenty five years ago. This dynasty for the Patriots ended like five years ago, six years ago, and then this one immediately started. That's what's so nuts about it. Usually, there's like a gap period, or it feels like there is especially because the Patriots stretched theirs out over 20 years. So there really wasn't a gap with them because there wasn't like a 2000s dynasty and a 2010s dynasty. They were both. They were the millennium dynasty, right? But then this happens and this is the greatest start ever. So, so is it fair to start having it after last night? Absolutely. It, it is 100% unequivocally fair to have the argument. But I think the argument is more, will he surpass him? Can he surpass him? When will he surpass him? Then it is, is Mahomes better than Brady today? I mean, let's just say it like it is. As far as an athlete is concerned, I mean, good God, yes. One was a six-round pick. One was a top-ten draft pick. 
One's got one of the biggest cannons in the league, league history. Brady's not that guy. Brady was the greatest game manager in the history of the sport. And that's not a slight. The guy who was the most trustworthy person in sports, the guy you relied upon the most, the guy that was going to make the right decision every single time, the guy that if you needed a win, if you needed to drive, he was it. That's what I mean by game manager. Nobody managed the team better than him. And that was also in the midst of a lot of incredible plays, a lot of incredible plays from Tom Brady as well, right? But as far as an athlete is concerned, an overall specimen of a quarterback, it's not close. Of course, it's Mahomes. Of course, it's Mahomes. But that's really not how we delegate the greatest of all time. And we can't just change the rules, Nick Wright and all the other people who do it. We can't just change the rules today to fit the narrative Mahomes is the best. The rule has always been the most championships, right? Most this, the most that. It's always been about the team awards that have made the quarterback so great. And Brady still has double the amount that Mahomes has. But the biggest difference here, in my opinion, as to why I think it's very likely and possible that Mahomes can do this, Brady went a full decade without winning another one, which makes it even more impressive, the fact that he was able to get to six in his trophy case. Do you in a do you in any capacity right now, the way things are going for foresee a decade span where these Chiefs don't win another Super Bowl? Do you really foresee that? And that alone, if they even win one with Mahomes in the next 10 years, they have already surpassed the pace in which the Patriots have done it. So to say it's likely for them to be able to do it is fair and I think 100% accurate. I don't think it's fair for Brady to have left, left the league after a year where it was unequivocal that he was the greatest we've ever seen. I don't think it's fair to just anoint Patrick Mahomes now. Brady also beat Mahomes two times in the playoffs. Two quarterbacks have ever beaten Mahomes in the playoffs. One was Joe Burrow, and the other is Tom Brady, who did it twice in the AFC Championship and in the Super Bowl with the Bucs. So to me, at the end of the day, even if there's people out there who think it's a tie, the tiebreaker to me would be Brady beating Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Would that not be the ultimate tiebreaker as of right now? Even if you think it's tied, split down the middle. Well, there's your tiebreaker, and it wasn't close. They beat him 31-9, to I believe. So let's pump the brakes. Let's sit and watch. But I think on the other end of things, you're nuts to not think that it's a fair uh, argument to be having as far as is he going to do it? Is he on pace? Um, You know, when will he do it, if ever? Like those type of conversations are more than fair. And I think they're more than fair, the conversations of having the comparisons between the overall Patriots and the overall Chiefs. I think that's more than fair. I think it's more than fair. The only thing out of this whole thing I don't think is fair is to to unequivocally say Mahomes is the better quarterback now. There's a lot of things about Mahomes that are better than Brady, surely. Yeah, you know, I mean, like it, there's a lot of things about him that are the greatest we've ever seen in, about anything. I mean, I th- I think that his overall aura as a quarterback is probably the best I've ever seen. Like the ability to like last night scramble for 66 yards, even though it's not really his main part of his game, the running or a major part of it, really. It's just kind of an asset, like the the ability to do that. Brady's never doing that, never doing that. You add that with the ability to always execute the game winning drive, always execute the most necessary play, the most needed play, always be able to get the ball out of your hands fast, always be able to make and elevate teammates around you. These are the comparisons you make with Brady, right? Like, think about who Bro- what Brady had at his disposal. No one knew who Edelman was until Edelman got there and Brady made Edelman Edelman, right? Gronk, um, you know, uh, so many guys, like, the only real bona fide, like, uh, throughout his whole career, the only bona fide, oh, my God, first ballot Hall of Fame weapon he had at the wide receiver position was Randy Moss, and they didn't even win a Super Bowl with Randy Moss. Right. When you have guys like Danny Amendola and and Julian Edelman, like these guys wouldn't have been 
what they were if it wasn't for there. And I, and it's kind of similar, like right now what we're watching here. Because a lot of similarities are being had. Last night, the best receiver they had on the field last night for the Chiefs was a rookie. You know? But time will tell. Time will tell how far this goes. It's funny. We could sit here, you know, many people have said this about so many teams throughout the past. Teams have, they, this was said about the Jets, you know, two AFC championships. Oh, we'll be back. We'll be back. Two consecutive AFC championships. We'll be back. Bills, four consecutive Super Bowls. We'll get one eventually, right? Um, Niners, Niners, right? Been in and around the Super Bowl for the last two decades. Haven't won a single one. You always say you're going to be able to do it or get over there and do it and this and that. Because it seems like in the time, like Seattle, another great example with Russell Wilson back in the Legion of Boom days. We'll be back. We'll do this. And um, it doesn't really work out like that. So it's easy in the moment to say it'll continue. But the reason I think that it does continue is because they've continuously done it. Those other teams, they had their spurts two, three years. We're now on a war path of six years here consecutively where the worst thing you have to show for it is an overtime AFC championship loss. So bit of a difference between them and, and the rest. Before we round out, C. Jello saying, do you uh, expect a Mahomes decline once Kelsey retires? I, I said this a bit earlier if you weren't around, C. I said, I don't expect a decline until I see a decline. I saw a decline this year. They won a Super Bowl. I expected a decline when Tyreek Hill uh, left. They've won two without him. I, I have no leg to stand on anymore to sit back and say this guy's going to decline because of this or because of that or because of this guy or this guy or whatever. I'll see it when I see it. I thought it was this year, and it wasn't. So the, the, we, we talked about it earlier. I thought losing Hill would be the ultimate indicator as to whether or not this team would step backwards. And if anything, they have stepped forward. They have won more Super Bowls now without Tyreek Hill than they won with him, and they did it in two consecutive seasons. It's insane. So I don't expect a decline until I see a decline. And when that happens is to be determined, but based on what we've seen, it won't be happening anytime soon. So Crazy, crazy shit. All right. Hey, wow. Almost three hours in the books. We're already after midnight. I'm barely realizing what time it is. Holy smokes. Well, hey, thanks so much for hanging around tonight, folks. Recapping the Super Bowl. I hope you enjoyed the game. Tough not to, even though we didn't love either team in it. Even though we didn't love the team that won it, you had to have loved the way the game went as far as football is concerned. It was an amazing ending. Overtime again for only the second time in NFL history. Truly a fun watch, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope you guys enjoyed the recap here tonight on the Smoke Break as much as I did. I love being able to talk about it with you and having you in. On your way out, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe button, and the bell as well to get the notifications. And once again, make sure to check out my friends over at BetUS. Click that link in the bio. You'll be able to get 125% bonus, not only on your first deposit, but on your first three deposits with the promo code JOIN125. Plus, you get 10% gambler's insurance for your net losses if you're active for six months so click all that stuff on your way out for me does me a big favor and we'll see you later on in the week we'll have another show for you uh rico tomorrow so make sure to keep it locked on buffalo fanatics all week but until then until the next time i see you much love appreciate you having uh me in your house tonight and i'll see you on the next one and as always go bells <laughs>